Uh, even though by today's standards, when we look back at the Civil War and you look at the behemoths of uh, oh, the wilderness and Spotsylvania and Gettysburg, this thing's small. But for the time it was fought, it was considered a, a big deal. In fact, it was the, uh, it was the only uh, battle size engagement in the large, not the only, but the largest uh, fought east of the Alleghenies for nine months of the war. So between the end of the first battle of Manassas in, uh, uh, on July 21st, 1801, until the Battle of Williamsburg on May 5th, 1862, in the east, granted we had Shiloh in a different area, which was so much bigger, but in the east, that believe it or not, the first battle of Kernstown is the largest battle fought east of the Alleghenies. And it received a lot of attention for that. Um, it was amazing when I was doing my research on this. I started writing that book 25 years ago. I can't believe that. Got so old. <laughs> but back then, when uh, there was still no internet to help us out, uh, everything was done by reeling through microfilm. And the number of things that you could come up by reeling through old county newspapers, letters that were written, I've come up with over um, 100 letters uh, during this period uh, leading up to surrounding and immediate aftermath of the battle that have really, even though they've been published technically back in the 1862 period, they hadn't seen the light of day since then. So it's all new material that helped us really define what happened out here. So a uh, couple other uh, distinguishing features of this battle for, for more trivia-minded buffs. Uh, you could win a bar stool bet on this one. It is the only battle, we know that some battles, right, um, Sharpsburg, Antietam, Bull Run Manassas, they have both a Union and a Confederate derived name. This is the only battle that's a Union victory and yet is only known by its Confederate name. Do you know what the Union name for this battle was? Winchester. Battle Winchester. Who knew <laughs> there were going to be several more battles around Winchester, but this was called the, the Battle Winchester when it was fought, which it certainly got adopted later on in, in, in May when Jackson came back to the battle. Uh, it also probably ranks as one of the coldest uh, battles fought, I guess that's appropriate for today, uh, in the Civil War. It's this day in uh, 1862 was a colder battle than when the Battle of Fredericksburg was fought the following December. We wouldn't think of it that way, but even though it's the first Sunday of spring in 1862, in the morning, the temperature in Cumberland, we have those readings at 7 a.m. was 35. Uh, the temperature at uh, uh, Georgetown was 37 uh, at 7 a.m. So it was so 35 kind of makes sense for this area out here this morning. I guess we're dropping down to 39 sometime this morning. So we're pretty close to that. The high in uh, Georgetown got to 52 on March 23rd, 1862. So probably didn't get much higher than the upper 40s out here uh, that day. So that's the, that's the kind of battle that we saw here that day. What I'm going to do is kind of give you an introduction that's leading us to the point of the battle from here. We'll go up on the hill and then, and then develop the battle as it occurred on the field. Uh, so I got a couple of, I didn't know this, but from our own uh, KBA uh, personnel, we have some ancestors that were here. Anybody else that had ancestors that were in this battle? How many of you have, been, have toured the first Kernstown battlefield before? Seen it before? Okay, well, we'll try to... I can't change the outcome for some of this, so it's going to end up being the same, but let's, let's hope this sparks some interest in it. I like to have it in the smaller groups. Less chance to get the virus. We got that going for us. Yeah. <laughs> but also opens up a lot of room for questions for anybody that, uh, that has any. So let's start. I'm going to bring this in. Um, and We're actually not even at the close of the very first year of the war. So without rehashing the whole war, let's bring this into the valley uh, in early 1862. So this brings our most famous military figure in the, in the world at this stage, partly because of his name, Stonewall Jackson, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, okay, 30, he turned uh, 38 in January, born around midnight, somewhere between the 20th and the 21st. Uh, he is a major general in charge of the Valley District, which is an independent division in the Valley, which has shrunk considerably through the winter. When Jackson came out here at the end of uh, uh, November of 1861, he had just been uh, uh, elevated in rank from Brigadier General to Major General for his performance on Henry House Hill the previous July, earned the sobriquet of Stonewall, as did the brigade, his namesake brigade, which became the Stonewall Brigade, 
They'll be joining him out here. He'll have a uh, he'll have an abrupted late 1861 winter campaign, for example, at Dam Number Five at Williams um, at Williamsburg, and then comes back here. Uh, and then what he's going to do in 1862 is he's going to start incorporating more uh, men into his ranks. That Williamsburg, Williamsport. He brings in Loring's Army of the Northwest. All right, they come in from what is now West, West Virginia, but would have been Western Virginia. Uh, he, has, uh, he has troops that consist of Virginians, Arkansans, uh, Tennesseans. Anybody familiar with Sam Watkins' Company H, that very famous book that was quoted so often in the Ken Burns series? Uh, Sam, Sam Watkins is part of Jackson's force. In, in early January of 1862. That's going to change dramatically because when Jackson leaves on his first campaign, which becomes known as the Romney campaign, Jackson will leave on January 1st when the weather starts out at 70 degrees in the morning and then drops, which is almost a, uh, a metaphor for what happens to him in the campaign. He heads almost due north, a little northeast toward toward Hancock, Maryland. He's trying to get across the Potomac River, which would have been a real invasion of the North. Uh, doesn't get approval by uh, the superior, his superiors in rank at that time, which was his uh, commanding general, Joseph Eggleston Johnson, to do that. He's thwarted by the Union command that's up there. He will then head over toward Romney, take possession of that town, lead part of his troops there under William Loring, comes back with the Stonewall Brigade in early February. Loring's men who hate being in Romney will get behind Jackson's back and, and petition the Confederate War Department, Judah Benjamin, to recall those troops to Winchester. That leads to Jackson's very temporary resignation. He's talked out of it by his favorite sounding board, the Confederate Congressman A.R. Bodler, whose son ends up serving uh, in the Rockbridge Artillery in Jackson's unit, as does Robert E. Lee's son. So there's some famous people in there. Um, and so Jackson keeps his command generally around Winchester. I consider the winter campaign, which we always call something separate than the Valley Campaign, as part of the Valley Campaign. If you had uh, 100 historians and you ask them, when did the Valley Campaign of 1862 end, they'll all tell you either with the Battle of Port Republic on July 9th or the week later when Jackson leaves the Valley. That all makes sense. If you ask those same people when it started, you're going to get at least five different answers. You'll get from the day after the Battle of Kernstown, from the day of the Battle of Kernstown, from the day that Jackson leaves Winchester. Some will leave it with McDowell. I would actually say, to take it literally, the Valley Campaign of 1862 began on January 1st, because except for three weeks of that campaign, um, when Jackson is at the, uh, the outskirts of the true Shenandoah Valley, he spends that entire winter within the corridors of the Shenandoah Valley. So he's here. That's why I call it that. And it's very convenient for me to say that, by the way, even though I didn't plan it that way, because uh, the Battle of Kernstown almost divides that campaign in half. All right, So the first uh, 84 days leading up to the Battle of Kernstown, Jackson's change of fortunes will, will occur in the second half, the 86 days that follow. And to give you an idea of how Jackson's fortunes change, you only have to look at what his critics are saying about him. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's secretary, John Hay, will write this about Jackson in February of 1862. He calls Jackson a queer, blundering, thick-skulled, honest dunce. Okay? By the way, queer is an adjective in this sentence, all right? Queer, thick-skulled, blundering, honest dunce. Let's go glass half full, they see called him honest, right? At the end of that campaign, the same person is saying this about Joe Stonewall Jackson. He is our lively and enterprising contemporary, flushed with bold ideas and fanatically sure of his cause. Same guy. All right, so what changed his mind? This campaign. So what you are going to see out here today is the spark that generated that whole change of Jackson's opinion. But I really want to leave you with the, without, um, without any hyperbole or exaggeration how bad things were going for Jackson in that first half that led up to this battle, and then we'll, we'll talk about what happens in the second half at the end of our tour today. But in that first half, Jackson, who started out with 10,000 men on January 1st, has dwindled down to a paper strength 
of roughly about 4,000 by the time he is holed up here in Winchester in the second week of March of 1862 with a huge collecting Union force around him, almost encircling the area. And Jackson's no longer going to be able to hold the town. And he calls for a withdrawal of this force. All right? uh, unfortunately, I have no evidence that he ever, uh, ever had been communicated with or communicated himself to Joseph Eggleston Johnson, who's a commanding officer who had uh, the large majority of the Army of Northern Virginia uh, troops in the Manassas area at Centerville. And by the way, it is called the Department of Northern Virginia before Robert E. Lee takes it over. And then the uh, Aquia district under Theophilus Holmes, they have already pulled back. So Jackson is sticking out in this valley like a sore thumb, while the rest of the Confederates have already pulled back deeper south into Virginia as early as March 8th and Mar March 9th. So here he is on March 11th as the only northernmost Virginia extension of that Army of Northern Virginia. And George McClellan has sent enough troops out here to really overwhelm Jackson's position. He will call, and it's at the northern side of town. We're about, by, by Winchester standards in 1862, we're almost four miles south of Winchester in 1862, so about five miles north of us. Jackson is at the, uh, the head's headquarters the home of uh, Lewis T. Moore, Lieutenant Colonel of the 4th Virginia and great-grandfather of Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, and he calls a council of war with his officers and he is, instead of uh, wanting to retreat, he wants to do something very rare in the Civil War and that's to launch a night attack. The men have already pulled back. They've already pulled back as far south as Kernstown. And here Jackson is five miles north of town calling his off, or five miles north of us and, and at the northern outskirts of town, calling his officers together to say, let's bring them back and attack uh, Nathaniel Banks' force north of us. And he had to be reminded that his supplies, where the men have already pulled back to where we are, are even going further south down to where Stephen City is today, which was called Newtown back then. So Jackson was forced to call that whole thing off. He's not happy about it. He calls the retreat, and on, uh, even though the accounts say it's that night, I don't think he would have seen what's claimed that he saw. I think it was probably more like on the morning of the 12th, somewhere in this, in this vicinity. He's up on a hill, and he says that uh, with, with his face all determined and, and flustered, look on it in his uh, countenance, he tells uh, Hunter McGuire, his surgeon, that is the last council of war I will ever hold, and indeed it would be. So his men pull back. Ironically, and appropriately, to a town called Mount Jackson, 40 miles south of here, which still exists today. And so that leaves Winchester for the inviting for its first takeover. And that'll occur on March 12th, a day that warms up uh, into the upper 60s. The flag of the United States is hung over the courthouse. And as a soldier in the 7th Virginia, or 7th Virginia, 7th Indiana, Samuel List will write to his parents, he says, Winchester is a very nice town. It is too pretty a place to belong to secession, and I believe that we have permanently taken it from them. So those that know Winchester's history knows how much of a misstatement that is, because the town of Winchester will officially have the flag change over the courthouse 13 times during the war, but by actual occupations, uh, we always say 72, but if you add up the diarist accounts, including six times in one day, you can come up with 91 different takeovers of the town of Winchester. So a little bit of a misstatement by that Indiana soldier. But for this moment, on March 12th, and for the next several days, uh, it is a Union base of operations. But it's not determined to be that for too long, because Abraham Lincoln, on March 16th, will send a directive, uh, because George Britton McClellan is launching his peninsula campaign, this armada of ships that's going to head down to the Yorktown Peninsula. And Lincoln insists on a covering force around Washington so that he has enough troops to man the forts around Washington in case there's some outside invasion while McClellan's uh, heading toward the Confederate capital. Lincoln didn't want a, a situation, as he called it, where, where they would be swapping queens. In other words, Confederates would be attacking the U.S. capital. So he wanted, he wanted uh, enough troops to protect. So Nathaniel Banks, who is the, uh, without military experience, is the is the third ranking officer in the Union Army, believe it or not, at this stage. Uh, McClellan, um, 
uh, and then it's uh, uh, Fremont and then Banks, uh, is told that he needs to send half of his two-man, two division corps, which is starting as the 5th Corps of the Army of the Potomac, he needs them sent back to Washington. He will choose his own original division, commanded by Alphys S. Williams, and beginning on March 17th, Williams' men, who aren't too far from here, more toward Winchester, will start departing the Shenandoah Valley heading east through Snickers Gap, where Route 7 goes through today. We're going to see Snickers Gap from our uh, position up on, on uh, Pritchard's Hill. So that leaves one division left under James Shields. All right? Shields' men are going to be uh, uh, conducting a reconnaissance in uh, March 18th, but when they pull back to, uh, to this region, they will go past Kernstown, they'll go past Winchester, and they'll head up near Stevenson's Depot, north of town and tucked out of the view of the citizens. So the citizens of Winchester are under the impression that not only is Alpheus S. Williams departed Winchester to the east, they think Shields has departed Winchester to the north. And indeed, Shields has a, uh, a regiment like uh, the, the 7th uh, West Virginia, we'll call it today, I'll predate statehood. The 7th Union Virginia or the 7th West Virginia is, is man in Martinsburg, so that made sense that they were already going way out of town. They aren't. That whole division is still well within <laughs> striking distance of Winchester. So Jackson, who has a network of spies, and he has his own um, uh, eyes in the valley. While he's 40 miles south, his eyes uh, are his um, uh, cavalry, and they are led by the flamboyant, uh, ostentatious cavalier, uh, Colonel Turner Ashby, who just got promoted to command a month earlier. And Ashby is up around this region. He has his, his men disguised as farmers selling eggs in Winchester, and they get word that, oh yeah, all the Union troops have been leaving or are about to leave, so they see a token force around the region, and Ashby gets that message, sends that word further south toward Jackson, and in the meantime, he's going to try uh, to, put a, uh, to put a hit on this area so he can take over Winchester and wait for Jackson's arrival. While all this is going on, Jackson is getting prodded, believe it or not, Jackson needs some prodding apparently, by his superior officer, Joseph Eggleston Johnson, who reminds Jackson that he has pulled way deep into the Shenandoah Valley and that, uh, that he needs to close the gap that exists currently between him and Nathaniel Banks. So that, um, that message to Jackson is delivered to him on March 19th, and beginning on March 20th, Jackson will start moving northward from Mount Jackson in this region. All right? By March 22nd, as Jackson is pulling his force in toward the Cedar Creek and Strasburg area, Turner Ashby will launch an attack on the, what he believes is a token force that's here. And that occurs where, near where Burger King is today. And the heights behind that were called Potato Hill, and the area around that was called Milltown. In fact, where the Ford dealership is today was the, where the Hollingsworth Mill was. The, parking lot behind the Ford dealership was the old mill pond. And so that's where that uh, attack gets launched. Je uh, Ashby has a three-gun horse artillery with him, commanded by an 18-year-old, uh, Captain Roger Preston Chu out of Charlestown, and they will open fire uh, on, on to, to Potato Hill. The Union uh, uh, resistance immediately forms, personally directed by the division commander, James Shields, who I'll talk about more up on the hill a little bit. And as he's positioning artillery, the only casualty that occurs, occurs with one round, actually two casualties. The round hits the horse and explodes on its head. This is the Confederate round hits the Union horse. Uh, a fragment of the round kills the Union artillerist manning that piece, and that is uh, um, Jacob Yeager, the first casualty of this prelude. And a fragment of the same shell hits uh, General, Brigadier General James Shields uh, above the left elbow and breaks his arm. So Shields will be taken back to Winchester, where Banks' sleeping quarters is, the, uh, the Seavers' house on a um, uh, house that still stands on the, what was on the western side of town. Banks is still in Winchester. His division has departed. Shields is north of town. And that skirmish ends with, Jack, uh, with Ashby in retreat. He loses one casualty, a capture, uh, from Company A named John Kitchener. 
all right? So Ashby didn't see anything that convinced him that there was much more than a token force around Winchester. Actually, if this happened a little later in the campaign, I think Ashby would have realized that when you see eight cannons on, on the hill, that there's probably something more than a, a few regiments around. But that's the way he interpreted it, because he didn't see a lot of infantry with them. And he will send the word back to Stonewall Jackson that if he sends him a little, if Jackson sends it, uh, Ashby a little bit of infantry in the morning that he will be able to take over the town and await for Jackson's arrival. So the message doesn't have to go very far now. Instead of going all the way to Mount Jackson, it now only has to go uh, from this region another 15 miles to, to where Jackson had his headquarters at the George Hupp House, still stands uh, at the base of Hupp Hill near Strasburg. And so in the morning, uh, Stonewall Jackson will detach uh, a few companies of infantry, not as much as I'm sure as Ashby wanted, and sends them northward. And he decides that he is going to get his whole army in line and start marching to Winchester on the same mission. It's important to realize that Jackson's mission in the valley, which will change during the course of the campaign, but his mission in the valley in March is to keep as close as, this is Johnson's exact wording, keep as close as prudence will allow. In other words, don't attack. Your, your mission is to get close enough to the enemy to prevent them from sending troops out to reinforce McClellan's campaign, but not to attack them. Uh, certainly no grand effort to try to draw troops into the valleys. Try to keep the troops occupied so they don't all leave. It's pretty clear by that morning of uh, Sunday morning, March 23rd, that Jackson already thinks that that mission is already probably defunct because he's already heard from his citizen spies that the town of Winchester's evacuated. Ashby's told him the same thing, that there's just a token force here. He sent with infantry to Ashby to take over Winchester, which is essentially evacuated, so that he could just reclaim his base of operations. So the mission's going to have to change. But it's a big mistake, right? Because what's around here, north of Winchester in the Stevenson's Depot area, is a full brigade of Shields Division, 2,300 men. And now in our area, in the Kernstown area, which I'll talk about more on the hill, there's another two brigades. So we'll talk about the composition of the force, the size of it. But there's still a full division here. And so that sets the scene. Jackson's division at Strasburg no longer numbers at 10,000 men <laughs> that we talked about in January. And it doesn't include our Kansas troops, and it doesn't include Tennessee troops anymore. It is an all Virginia division except for a couple of Maryland companies, one in the 7th Virginia Cavalry, uh, one in the 21st Virginia. So by today's standards it would be Virginia and West Virginia, but back then it was Virginia. <clears throat> and at 7 a.m. in that 37 degree weather, they're all lined up on the Valley Pike Route 11, and you can see the thousands of miniature little uh, expiration clouds coming from their bodies as they're lining up to march. And Jackson will write a, a message to his superior, Joseph Eggleston Johnson, says, with the blessing of an ever kind providence, I hope to be in the vicinity of Winchester this evening. And at 7 a.m., with Ashby much further north than him ready to do his business, Jackson will start moving his men, orders them to march northward toward our position here. Keep track of the date. Ironies of history, right? It is Sunday, March 23rd, 1862. On the same date, in 1775, Patrick Henry had stood up in St. John's Church in Virginia and gave that passionate speech that ended, I know not what course the others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Jackson and his all-Virginia division did not know it at this time. But they're about to play out the theme of Patrick Henry's speech exactly four score and seven years later. All right, so we're going to pick that up now on the hill. Any questions about what I covered so far? Well, quite, yeah, you mentioned that Jackson had 10,000 men. But not anymore. He is down to uh, 3,700 so in what, all arms. What was causing the attrition from 10,000? Yeah, yeah, the cause of the attrition, well, first of all, reassignments. That's what the Arkansas and Tennessee troops are reassigned. He tried to get people like Loring court-martialed, and instead Loring gets, uh, uh, gets promoted. 
from Brigadier General to Major General and sent out of Jackson's division with a lot of the troops that go with him. So Jackson is reduced now to nine infantry regiments and a battalion and some artillery and some cavalry. We're going to talk a lot more about, we have some good artillery experts to, to fill, fill you in on some more of that this morning, but that's the size of his force. His infantry, if you read the accounts, he'll say he engaged 2,742 infantry with one regiment, the 48th Virginia, in reserve at, at Stephen City. Now that's a little apples to oranges comparison. They never count officers when they give those numbers, but let, let's say it's pretty safe to say he didn't have more than 3,000 infantry here. Okay, so they went from 10 to 3 because the militia was a, a significant part of Jackson's, not the majority, but a, a significant part of his troops when they moved north, they proved very hapless and they won't be involved here. So they're out. The reassigned regiments are out. There are illnesses that take out about 1,100 men. There are officers and men discharged by the Bounty and Furlough Act and trying to recruit Jackson's strength. So for various reasons, he's under strength. Um, there are desertions. We have, uh, I know this sounds like an oxymoron, but Daniel Banks had a very good intelligence file that he kept on uh, uh, detailed accounts of deserters that came from Confederate lines to Union lines and got all their statements. There's a nice copy of that reel in the Hanley Library. Very revealing stuff without, uh, without any kind of uh, <laughs> waterboarding or any other torturous treatment, they were revealing a lot of things about the Confederate positions here. So Jackson has lost a lot of men for that reason as well. He'll have a second wave of desertions that occur that's usually not as well documented but, um, a couple months later in May. And we can talk about that toward the end of the day. But now he's just strictly, the reason why Johnson, and Johnson's well aware of this, Joseph Eggleston Johnson, when he says get as close as prudence will allow, he knows that he's very under strength. He doesn't want to fight. Right? So that was the whole idea. But if you showed his face around this area, at least it'll give the impression, hey, on the Union side, we can't keep sending more troops out of the valley. There's still a significant force in here that we have to, to face off against. Any other questions about that? Sure. You said uh, Jackson moved his command from Winchester to Mount Jackson. Yeah. How long did it take them? To Two days. Go? Two days? Uh, well, let's see, the 12th, 14th. Well, they did it more slowly because they were they weren't heavily pressed once they got there. Uh, they were in Mount Jackson by the uh, the 15th, I believe. Okay. The 15th. That, and they, does that town still exist? Mount yes. Yeah. It's actually back then. It was the very. It was the terminus of the Manassas Gap Railroad. The Manassas Gap Railroad um, did a 90 degree turn from Strasburg southward and Mount Jackson, which is right near Newmarket. It's still. A, it's got a lot of its Civil War integrity to it. As you drive through it, they, when they widened Route 11, the Valley Pike for Route 11, it took out everybody's front guards in those towns. Just do a nice drive up, down, or up Route 11. Remember, Valley nomenclature because of the flow of the river. When you go down, you are going north. When you go up, you're going south, okay? So if you go up the Valley Pike toward Mount Jackson today, just drive through all those towns, and you'll see a lot of the antebellum houses that are still there, without front guards anymore. Goes right up to the right up to the porches in some cases, right? You don't you get the best view of that in Mount Jackson, I always thought, because you get to see how people's uh, uh, front yards are taken out by that uh, <clears throat> by that road. Any other questions on what's going on in March? That's probably the best Reader's Digest version I can do of it. We're going to go up on the hill. Okay. Take this map. Everybody sign in for lunch. <coughs> I'm going to sign is the Blue Ridge, okay? And this bump up here, this dead ahead of us, south of us, is the Massanutten Mountain, which uh, makes the Shenandoah Valley very unique because it's a 55 mile sawtoothed topped chain that uh, runs from Strasburg all the way south up the valley uh, to Harrisonburg, about 55 miles and it divides the valley again. So right now we're in about the widest part of the Shenandoah Valley proper. In fact, if you, if you see the gaps here, the one right ahead of us here is Ashby's Gap, named after an uncle ancestor of uh, Turner Ashby. Um, that's where Route 50 goes through today. That was Jackson's route out of the valley for the first battle of Manassas. 
The Ennis troops went up and over that. Picked up the trains at Piedmont Station, which is Della Plain today. You could actually go see that station and rode that into uh, Manassas Junction. Okay? <coughs> That's Ashby's Gap. That's closer to us. The, if you follow the line of the Blue Ridge, you see the next little bump ahead of us out there? That's Snickers Gap. That's where William's division left the valley uh, beginning March 17th over Castleman's Ferry um, and then up and over <clears throat> Snickers Gap. That goes out to Leesburg, for example. That, I think I did this last year, I did the plotting on the Google map with measured distance. From this peak to that peak, I think it's about 20 or 21 miles. All right? So when you look beyond this ridge, this height, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, and you see the distant ridge back there, <clears throat> that's Little North Mountain of the Alleghenies. That's the other border of the Shenandoah Valley, which is about another six miles from us. All right, so the widest part of the valley is about 26 miles, which is where we are now, roughly about that, okay? So the Mass of Nutton actually, and you can actually look up from where Front Royal is on the left, where the Mass of Nutton divides, and that would be the Luray or Page Valley. And in some segments of that, it's only six miles across. And that's where the south fork of the Shenandoah is coming from, because the elevation's going higher, so all the headwaters are feeding into the south fork of the Shenandoah. And then it's still called the Shenandoah Valley on the other side of the Massanutten. But you see the Massanutten, the, the peak that we're looking at ahead of us would be where Signal Knob is. And there you see the Alleghenies in the distance, that distant ridge. <clears throat> that would be where Strasburg is, heading further up to Harrisonburg, to Stanton, and beyond, right? <clears throat> and I always, everybody's gonna have to forgive me for telling this, because I say this all the time when I'm with groups. But I, I'm from near Niagara Falls, New York. <clears throat> so I'm not indigenous to the Virginia area, as people can still hear my an accent. I had ancestors, though, that came from the Shenandoah Valley, which is always kind of interesting to me, um, and from Loudoun County. So <clears throat> yes, if you're not from the area, you got to get the names right, right? So what looks like Strasburg or, or, or uh, Strasburg is, is Strasburg, right? And what looks like um, Staunton is Stanton. What looks like uh, McGahee'sville is pronounced. Anybody know? McGahee's. McGahee'sville. What looks like Buena Vista is? Yeah. Buena Vista, yeah. right? Right. So, <laughs> so I always, I always was impressed with that and very relieved because when I came out here, everybody tried to call me their ace in the hole, and I'm not going to even tell you how they started pronouncing that one. So I was <laughs> quite relieved to hear that it was just a pronunciation problem. All right, so here we are. This is that, that's your, that's your divider. So Jackson came from Mount Jackson, which was that way. <clears throat> you can actually route. see where it is, by the way. If you, if you go to the, you look at the silo and you go to the, north, the top of the silo, just off the left of that, that's Mount Jackson. Yeah, that, that peak. <laughs> that peak right the there. Peak. And so, and then the town is actually just a little bit to the right of it, as we're looking at it, right? And that's also called Seven Mile Mountain, right? Yeah. Right, so that's, uh, thank you for telling me that. So that's, that's, your, that's kind of your divider, but that's way out there. That's about 40 miles, okay? You get the idea? So we have a nice, beautiful view of it today. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that's where Jackson came from, and he went, his, his extent of his march to March 20. Second was almost where Signal Knob is today, but looking to the right of it where Cedar Creek would have been, that's almost where he started his march from. All right. Now this hill to the inside of the Alleghenies is a little bit taller than the one we're on now, which I'll talk about in the difference. That is called Sand or Sandy Ridge. All right. Like the rest of the valley, it runs in the northeast southwest direction, but parallel to where uh, this ridge is. And today it's got a highway, Route 37, kind of dividing it. Um, and unlike the, their battlefield assessment that was done in the early 90s, they were wrong to claim that the highway cut into where you see the car running right now. Uh, that's Route 37, which actually does cut into the hill. It doesn't cut where the heavy fighting of the Battle of Kernstown occurred, though. But it makes it look like it's, it makes two, one hill look like it's two hills on each side of the road, but that wasn't the case. Where that highway is now was a flat plateau of Sandy Ridge, almost where you would say the military crest of it was, and there was at least one artillery battery on that. Now, dead ahead of me here, about three quarters of a mile away, you see that yellow house. 
that's going to be our we're going to see that house from the other side this afternoon because on the other side of the house you see the trees that are behind it and you see the ground kind of um, elevate not all the way to where the Alleghenies are but that's a key part of Sandy Ridge where the first battle of Kernstown is going to be fought but because right on the other side of that house is the highway unfortunately and then just across the highway is the end the eastern end of a 400 yard shoulder high stone wall where the battle is going to be waged in the afternoon there's only very little vestige of that original wall left there's some of it that's recreated you'll see all of that this afternoon for those of you that are joining me, but that's where we're gonna be in the afternoon. The rest of the hill, Sandy Ridge, where the highway's running, you see the cluster of houses in the distance. That is gonna be where another artillery position is. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you see this highway pole right where I'm pointing now. That's where a third artillery position. So an artillery position by the yellow house, an artillery position there, this Confederate I'm talking about, and an artillery position there in the afternoon. We'll set it up, but kind of keep that in mind. The distance goes away from the hill, so the closest artillery position will be where the yellow house is. The furthest one, which is a full mile, is the houses on the military crest there. That line of trees behind them actually looks kind of the same as it did back in 1862. I know that because a field sketch artist for Frank Leslie's uh, uh, newspaper drew that, and it looks uh, you could you could match it up very well today. All right, so the Blue Ridge, the Alleghenies, Massanutten, two valleys there, one valley here, Sandy Ridge. Any questions about all that? So which, which direction were the artillery oriented in? Right at you, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, which there. I'll bring up in a few, uh, in a few minutes. We're gonna talk a lot more about the artillery um, composition, but I just wanna show you the positions are. We're standing on what's called Pritchard's Hill. Now, if you look down to your left and lower ground, and all around, even in these farm complexes and the buildings around here, a lot more buildings here than there were in 1862. The brick house ahead of us was there. It was built in 1854 by Samuel Reese Pritchard. It was one of the, before that, it was one of the original 16 um, homes that were occupied through um, the Shenandoah Valley and William uh, Hogg or Hogg, sometimes they're pronounced both of these H-O-G, UE was the first uh, one to have this area. The Height family will have where Bartonsville is now, that's where Springdale is, the 1754 house. But those are the occupiers of those original tracts of land. Opekin um, Church, the first church that's out there now, there's a, there's a, a structure that came up in uh, 1898, that's now the building with a lot of more modern uh, buildings around it. We'll see that a little from a better view down at ground level. Uh, that was there in the 1873 version of the church back in, uh, back in 1862. On this Pritchard's Hill property, there was a wheelwright shop, which we still have the foundation to today. There was a barn that no longer exists. Um, and uh, there might have been a tenant house in fact, that one right down there might have been there in 1862. I can't quite agree. This farm, the Bell Farm initially, and I'm pointing to it, the silo, uh, was not there. But it's, um, silos don't come up in a cylindrical form in this country until around 1900. Um, but, but the farm itself was existed, I think, as early as 1873. I think it was by uh, uh, Brown was the next part of that, but not there at the time of the battle. And then all that housing development way ahead of you wasn't even there 20, 20 years ago. Okay, that's kind of new. And that's what this would have looked like had we let it go. All right, so you get an idea about the openness of Pritchard's Hill. So I've already set up with Jackson moving up toward us on March 23rd, harking back to four score and seven years before that, right? And what's here at this time is skirmishing, not skirmishing, drilling. Because after the Union had, uh, cleared the area of Ashby Skirmish from the night before. And Ashby Skirmish went down the Valley Pike, meaning northward. Valley Pike, you would be able to see it very clear back then. It wouldn't have anything around it like it does now. Would have ran to our, uh, to our east all the way into Winchester. And the skirmish occurred a few miles uh, north of us. Ashby's drawn back all the way uh, another two and a half miles to 
Newtown or Stephen City. He will get four companies of Stonewall Brigade infantry and he'll begin to move northward in the morning. Here, it's Sunday morning, the first Sunday of spring. The citizens of Winchester are trying to go about their normal business. Uh, a lot of Winchester diarists, very opinionated. Mrs. Hugh Lee, for example, says, I did not see a single Yankee in church today. They are not a church-going people, is what she wrote. <laughs> well, they're a little busy. They're, they're told they have to be working this day and, and doing some uh, skirmishing drills. And um, Shields has got a broken arm in headquarters four miles from us. He calls in one of his brigade commanders, Jeremiah Sullivan who's a colonel, formerly of the 13th Indiana, and Shields tells Sullivan that his men are deficient in skirmishing, and even though Sullivan's complaining that his men are shoeless and they need rest, and he's actually correct. He writes, uh, um, my, my command is um, um, totally without shoes six days after the battle. They didn't have them the day of the battle either. So, they're, you know, Union troops without clothing is kind of unusual to think about, but this is no man's land for the Army of the Potomac, so uh, these guys aren't supplied very well. So they are, uh, Shields tells Sullivan, I don't care, um, you got to get ready for a battle that occurs sometime in the future. And Sullivan says, well, we didn't see any sign of uh, Stonewall Jackson. And Shields says, of course you're not going to see Stonewall Jackson. I know Stonewall Jackson very well, and Jackson is afraid of me, is what Shields said. Now, who's James Shields to be saying that? Here's James Shields. He is still the only guy in U.S. history to be elected to represent three different states in the U.S. Senate. Very good politician. Now back then, Senate elections were through the, uh, the state assembly houses, but still, you, to get elected for three different states is quite impressive. Uh, he had actually had two states under his belt by the time he's in the Civil War. His best days are behind him. Not necessarily age-wise, he's, uh, he's uh, 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 a year younger than me. I think he's like 56. but by his health. He, had, he was a very active commander in the Mexican War, but he is wounded so severely at the Battle of Cerro Gordo that they actually cleaned out the wound by passing a silk handkerchief right through his body, all the way through. He had a hole <laughs> all the way through where his lungs were. Somehow it didn't get rid of, get rid of the vital organs in the, in the process, and he survives all that. But he, um, he's from County Tyrone, Ireland very active in Illinois politics um, in the 1840s uh, and just had that stereotypical, except for the drinking part, which he's never really been accused of, but very feisty Irishman, I would say, because uh, he actually challenged one Illinois politician to a duel for writing slanderous articles against him back in 1842, which of course is illegal even in Illinois. And that affair was settled peacefully, although they had the duel set up on an island just outside of Alton uh, on the river. And it would have, could have changed history because uh, Shields is a very good marksman, all right? And you know who his dueling opponent was going to be? Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. <laughs> whose mm -hmm. wife was the one writing those articles, by the way. And Lincoln, then his girlfriend, Lincoln defended her and they ended up getting married. And nine months to the day after their wedding, their son Robert was born, to the day. All right, so, uh, so Lincoln's no idiot when they, <laughs> he knows Shields is a good marksman, and Shields is five foot seven, five foot eight. Lincoln's six, uh, six four. And when they, they had Lincoln choose the weapons, he chose broadswords. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, the duel never happened. But Lincoln will put Shields in charge of this division when its original commander, Frederick Lander, the one of whose I mentioned some people about a book I wrote about being very expensive today, uh, passed away on March second. So. Shields takes over that command. And what Shields has taken over is a is what's considered a Western Army, but it's really Midwest today. A lot of uh, Indiana troops, lots of Ohio troops, um, Western Virginia troops uh, as well, a couple of Pennsylvania regiments, and, um, and even an Illinois regiment. And these guys are very cocky. They've been very successful in the Rich Mountain Campaign. Uh, in the Corix Ford campaign that killed uh, Robert Selden Garnet, okay, that campaign itself. Uh, in the Western Virginia campaign around Romney in 1862, they, they pretty much took away most of Jackson's district to actually force him to leave Winchester on March 11th. So they're, they're really begging for a fight. In fact, I, don't, I still to this day don't know, know how it happened, but there's a soldier in the 8th Ohio who writes this two days before the battle. It is said that Jackson has retreated to Mount Jackson. 
Now, how would they know that? I have no idea. But this is a private writing this to his mother. And this is how he finishes it. He says, it is said that Jackson has fallen back to Mount Jackson. And if he's not careful, we will mount Jackson and ride him out of this part of the country for sure. So, so they want to fight. All right. So that's what they're looking for. And Shields says, okay, you guys are going to have to practice drilling. Jackson's afraid of me. You're not going to see him around town. Uh, and that's what Sullivan is doing here. When all of a sudden at 9 o'clock in the morning, he is getting opened on, probably right here on this hill, Pritchard's Hill, very commanding ground, because down near the Mahaney House, behind that housing complex is what is now a, uh, I think, a, a motel. But from that yard, uh, that three-gun horse battery of Turner Ashby has opened up on this position, and now the Union soldiers have plenty of reason for not attending Mrs. Lee's church. The Battle of Kernstown has begun. And the commander of that force won't be James Shields in field command. It's going to be his, his uh, next in line, his uh, ranking subordinate, who is Colonel Nathan Kimball. We'll talk more about him a little later. He's not quite 40 years old. He does not relinquish the command of his brigade. So he is the division commander de facto of this field, but also is still his own brigade commander. So he will have his brigade deployed and Sullivan's brigade deployed on the other side of the Valley Turnpike in a matter of about an hour. And then this hill not only will serve as Union headquarters, it will also be a very, very, especially for 1862, a dominant artillery position. And Larry, you fill us in on what's up here. Okay, um, first of all, the Union artillery forces consist of, uh, you've got Captain Jenks, I believe over on this side of the hill with a six gun battery. Captain uh, Clark is kind of in the center with another six-gun battery, and then you've got Ca uh, Captain uh, da Sam Davy, and I think he's only got a four, two, two gun, gun. yeah, two gun, yeah. He's a very short-handed. He gets called east of the uh, to support uh, Colonel Sullivan, so that leaves a twelve-gun, two-gun battery here, and then later on, Lieutenant Lucius Robinson comes up over the top of the hill, kind of out of sight. And with, he's got a collection of six-gun, uh, six-pound howitzers, uh, six-pound Napoleons, kind of a hobnob. And he sits up on top, so you've got uh, 18 guns here plus a couple over there. So the ranges from this hill over to San Sandy Ridge, if you look at that silver barn for orientation purposes, the Rock Ridge Artillery gets over in that area. That's 4,800 yards from here to there. And so 4,800 feet, 1,600 yards. What's the range of a 12 pound Napoleon? It's about 1,600 yards. This is max elevation, max, max range for those guns. So up, up where Gary pointed to the middle battery is about 4,400 feet, it's a little bit shorter. And then up north is where, uh, that's where uh, Waters uh, West Augusta battery is and the further north is 4200 yards where Captain John Carpenter and his four gun battery now you've got the main artillery in, in the battle the main artillery exchange for counter battery and suppression is going east to west so you've got max range but you've got a hundred feet higher hill over there to here so Jackson's first position is over near Rockbridge and he moves up north to Waters and he's encouraging, you know, let them know you're here. You know, keep shooting. Let them, even though Waters' rounds are dropping about halfway down the hill, right where the Union infantry is dug in, and they're down there laying with the dirt kicking up around them and, and trying to hide from the shells, and uh, Waters going, uh, I can't reach the hill, sir. And Jackson goes, keep shooting. Let them know you're here. It's, <laughs> keep their heads down. And uh, they do a pretty good job suppressing, and I believe they kill, what, 27 artillery horses on this hill? The, now, Tom, the, the, the line of 10 guns here and on the next hill aren't smoothbores, though. What are they? They're parrots. Yeah, parrots. and uh, three-inch ordnance rifles. They've got so at 5 degrees, they can go 2, a mile, a mile yards and a quarter, or quarter, mile and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. pretty, so pretty the accuracy, pretty. but the thing is, on the Union side, the gunners are very green, but they have this Lieutenant Colonel Philip Don, a, a, a Prussian, and he's up here in his German accent, driving them back to the guns with his sword. And once they realize when they when they start shooting, 
they're pretty accurate. They go, okay, we got this. And so they stick to their guns. Now as Waters is moving, and we'll get to this maneuver later on, but Waters, and with Jackson uh, taking his three batteries across where the warehouses are, and they're moving to Sandy Ridge, batteries on this hill hit one of the guns in a trunnion and knock one gun out of action. And once they get on the hill over there, I believe your book says one round goes, goes into a horse, goes through the horse, explodes, atomizes this horse in a bloody storm and, and paints this white horse completely red. Mm -hmm. and, and, there, and there's rounds that hit the fences over there and spin like tops and the Confederates are jumping on top of them. And severs the feet mm -hmm. of at least one of the artillerists yeah. that was near yeah. the horse. So it was an awful, awful shot. So what Somebody happened, said it was an awful introduction yeah. into the war. Today. Exactly. So what happens over here is these guns are effectively suppressed by the counter battery of those three over there and there's so much ammunition exchanged back and forth that I think they're down to like 20 rounds per battery by the end of the, the first few hours of the battle. There's not much left. But one thing I want to point out, Robinson gets sent by, by Colonel Kimball, can't hardly see it, but it goes down this farm lane right over the edge of the hill and out to Middle Road. There's, and if you, there's a couple of churches over there. Just is it off to the lower end of the yellow house, house and yeah. across the road. Yeah. He's over there and if you, you drive down Middle Road you'll see this a bowling alley. And see that new trail sign we have down by the uh, down by the uh, silo? We just put that in last August. We put it there because it's a convergence of Robinson's battery fire down this valley, the guns on this hill, and the maneuver north across that field, and I guess we're going to go to the we're south We're going to go field. down there. We're going to, we're going to pick it up after the Confederate As side. Gary walks you through Colonel Fulkerson's and General Garnett's advance, remember this convergence of artillery fire stops Colonel Fulkerson right about where that sign is and sends him west into the protection of the woods. But that's just about the time they start running low on ammo. Now, so thanks for filling us yeah. in. So on the Union position then, you got the 16 guns counting Robinson's behind with the 10 parrots, you have Davy with his two guns. Davy's the only one that'll extend his pieces past, uh, through Kernstown, but then he'll be driven back. Um, he's a bit spooked by all this and he's gonna resign on April 1st. So I think he's had enough of the war already. Um, uh, Jenks uh, of the West, I'm, by the way, I'm predating statehood for convenience sake. West Virginia becomes a state in June of 63. Uh, so I'm gonna call them West Virginia troops for the Union side and just Virginia troops on the Confederate side, okay? So that, that'll help us on that. So the West Virginia Battery A is up here. That's the parrots that are here from uh, Dalm's battery initially and now under Jenks. Dalm and the rest of these batteries do have experience in the 1861 West Virginia campaign. They fired before, but not in not an open field like this because you were in those mountainous areas in West Virginia. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of room where you would see that. But for example, at Blue's Gap, what's called Hanging Rock Gap, is there where, where you see that they had opened up earlier. Uh, Clark's parrots become more famous a little later in this campaign. Those are the guns that are on the coaling at Port Republic. Same guns, all right, that don't quite make it out of there, but they're the ones that are on the next hill over from here. So that's, for 1862, to have a line of 10, 10 pounder parrots, pretty darn impressive, all right, to have that, to have that firepower early on. And Jackson, when we talked about his artillery positioning, that's not gonna happen in the morning because he's not even at the field yet. Everything they're firing at has been Turner Ashby, who came as far as these houses, if we were seeing his troops move in that direction, they got behind a wall to this uh, eastern entrance to Pritchard's Lane, uh, to where you guys came in this morning. And then he is forced back and gets up on high ground almost where I-81 crosses just south of Kernstown, and he's forced to hold there. Um, and Kimball, who's in charge of all this, keeps getting messages from Shields back at headquarters saying, you know, the only one in front of you is Ashby, get off of this position and chase him down and capture him. And uh, there's no better way to say it, Kimball really commits an act of insubordination. He, does, he chooses not to do that. He gives himself his own discretion and says no. And if you think of his reasoning, what does he see with Ashby's men? Ashby has 300 cavalrymen. 
what does he see with Ashby's men that he didn't see yesterday, meaning on the 22nd of March, when he was involved with the skirmish and took over for Shields then? Infantry. He sees infantry. Not a lot. Oh, yeah. It's four companies of Stonewall Brigade infantry, um, three from the 2nd Virginia and one from the 27th, all under the command, I love the name, John, John Quincy Adams Nadenbush <laughs> um, of the 2nd Virginia. And he and so Shield sees that infantry, and he, or excuse me, Kimball sees that infantry, and he knows that that there's something more than just Ashby around here now, and it is March, and it's the first Sunday of spring, but you're not going to see a lot of leaves on the trees, and you might have Kimball probably has a a spy glass of maybe 10 power magnification, so if you look behind the warehouses. Do you see crowning the top over there, that little line of trees in the back? That is what's left of what's called Barton's Woods. Barton's Woods in 1862 came all the way to what is now Apple Valley Road. When somebody sees a car moving across Apple Valley Road. Oh, this side of the warehouses. Yeah, when somebody sees, like as I'm talking, if you see a car pointed out to us so I could show you where that road is, we're gonna go down almost to that road uh, when we wrap up the morning, but that just beyond that road is where Barton's Woods ended, where the warehouses are now. And so there's no leaves on the tree, and what Kimball can see in the late morning are more infantry in those woods. And so he's made the right call, okay, under different circumstances when he's told to get out. Oh, you see the car now in the distance yeah. moving? That is Apple Valley Road today, but that road did exist back there in 1862. And on the other side of that car, that would have been where Barton's Woods ended. Got it? All right, so so right now what's just a little minuscule vestige of it now pulls all the way up to the road. Oh, last thing about the Shenandoah Valley, by the way. It's kind of interesting. Most of the time a valley, the river runs right through the middle of it, right? Shenandoah Valley, your two branches of the, of the Shenandoah go around each side of the Massanutten. They form the Shenandoah River proper just to the left-hand side of that Massanutten Range where Front Royal is today. And then they kind of hug the uh, <clears throat> western base of the Blue Ridge instead of the middle where we are. And they follow that all the way to where the Shenandoah empties, which is where? Harpers Ferry. Harpers Ferry right? The water hole where it picks up the Potomac River. So it's an unusual valley in that its middle waterway is actually Hope Peck and Creek. There's other features of the valley that just make this such a special place. Like for example, the um, uh, a lot of times on mountains you see the, it's not a limestone base, but it's a base that's more for um, uh, uh, pines, right? You don't see a lot of pines up on Blue Ridge because that is a limestone base, so it's more deciduous trees. And around the Ope Peckin Creek Basin is where, you'd, where you see the pines. So it's just a, a, unique, a unique look at the valley. And Opeckin is more of a U-shaped waterway, but it does more fit the middle description of the valley. That's kind of what's unique about it. So anyway, Jackson moves his men. He's starting to move him through Barton's Woods. You get, you know where that road is now. And Kimball has two brigades essentially deployed. Sullivan's Brigade over east of the uh, Route 11. There'll be two regiments that never fire a gun in this battle. So we're gonna say they're on the battlefield. They add about a thousand men to the fight, but they'll never fire a gun. So they're essentially unengaged. He has his own initial brigade which consists of the uh, 67th Ohio, 14th Indiana, 5th Ohio, and the 84th Pennsylvania. So if you're looking at map 4B now on your sheet, you kind of got our position in the morning. We're on top of Pritchard's Hill. All right. This is before Jackson's deployed his artillery on Sandy Ridge, which Larry's already filled us in on. But if you turn the map upside down, 28th New York, <laughs> originally of Williams Division. So. Um, that's what's going on in this area. So when Jackson's moving through those woods, Kimball's got his men on a good defensive ground. He's gonna to have to be attacked <coughs> to be thrown off the height. He's thrown a lot of rounds already. By the end of the day, we have an accounting by the back battery, Robinson's battery, which will certainly open up a lot more when they redeploy. But I think they, uh, they log 240 something rounds fired by that battery alone. So you think about an equal number of rounds is fired by Jenks's First West Virginia and Clark's Fourth U.S. Battery E. There's probably more than 700 Union rounds fired from the course of the day from this hill. 
Why are we spending all the time in the hill? This hill is going to be the focal point of Stonewall Jackson. It is going to launch the Shenandoah Valley campaign. This is the most important spot to be on to understand the Shenandoah Valley campaign of 1862 because it starts because of this Union position. Jackson's, Jackson's job is to get this position neutralized, if not completely wiped out, so that he can own this region and take over from there. The Union, the union uh, objective is to hold on to this ground and, and cause as much damage to the opponent as you can ahead of you. So that's what's heading out here. When Jackson moves his men to where the warehouse is now, which would have been Woods, it's about two o'clock. We're gonna go down close to that spot and follow their line of march, but I'll give it from the Union perspective quickly so that you understand what's going on. Jackson will tell his commander, Samuel Vance Fulkerson, we'll talk more about him down there, to turn the battery on Pritchard's Hill. He shows that this is the Union right, and it is. There's nothing more over there. And he says, your, your job is to turn the battery. What does turn the battery mean? It flank it. And when I used to bring um, the Quantico Marines out here for their, um, their history teaching instructions, they actually taught me a lot. What they were aiming for, back then there was this tree line, you see it on your map. It's not the same trees, but it's the same tree line. So off of, um, off of Pritchard's Hill, behind the last battery, you see the little line of trees. That's these trees here. You'll see it from down at the ground level from where Fulkerson starts. That's what he's going to aim for to turn the battery. It's to get close enough to make it look like you're attacking them to force them to reorient their pieces so that if you have a secondary maneuver occurring, you've taken their attention away, all right? Or if you scare them enough without losing your whole command, you can, you can force them off the hill. And as Larry mentioned, a lot of these uh, Union artillerists up here are very spooked by all of a sudden the presence of 900 plus Virginians coming up that open marshy ground right toward that position. They're marching from the warehouses, almost in a line toward the, toward the farm today where the, where the silo is. And as they're heading in this direction, if you're an artillerist up here, it looks like they're coming right for you. And that's when he said a lot of them were abandoning their pieces. And it's Philip Down, uh, who will eventually get kicked out of service for, um, for drawing pay twice in a month. Can't do that. <laughs> All right? But he's still in charge here. He's 35 years old. And he brings the men back with the point of his sword and off and says he's going to cut off the head of anybody that dare leaves his pieces again. So with their newfound courage, the artillerists uh, re readjust their orientation uh, screws, lower their pieces a little bit, and they start getting the range. We're going to feel that range from the Confederate perspective. There's another car coming from it. We're going to be right about down there heading in this way, and it'll be a mini version of Pickett's Charge in many cases that you'll get to appreciate. From the Union perspective, there was a translated an account by one of the German gunners that ended up in a wheeling newspaper when he said, um, <clears throat> all the guns spit such fire with uh, much rapid uh, uh, quickness and perdition. And another one said, every round seemed to knock them right and left. Uh, so, uh, and you're gonna find that those statements aren't gonna be hyperbolic. You're gonna find that they really were doing a lot of damage to the infantry that was, uh, that was attacking down there. So uh, we're gonna pick that up. While that's going on is when Larry was talking about Jackson aligning his artillery, he's doing two things at once, moving them to those three positions on Sandy Ridge. So this is all occurring between two o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. And by three o'clock, if you're Nathan Kimball on this hill, you look out there and you realize you made a big mistake by not keeping troops out there because that converging Confederate fire, even though a lot of those rounds are falling short, there still is some, there's still at least one parrot up on the, the Rockbridge artillery position and the 20, uh, the, the two dozen horses are down. One of the artillerists had it, was decapitated up here and everybody's hugging the ground for dear life as the rounds are kicking through there. And Kimball finally receives word that his third brigade, the one that was near Stevenson's Depot, has finally marched through town and their commander has come up to him and reported to him. And they could hear Kimball talking to him and saying kind of under his breath, I got to take those batteries. So the complexion of what has been an artillery duel throughout the morning and early afternoon 
is about to change for good. But we're going to pick up what the effect of that artillery was from the Confederate perspective. All right. And uh, in the afternoon, we'll pick up what Kimball plans to do over at Sandy Ridge. But you'll get the portents of this from that commander of that 3rd Brigade, Erastus Tyler. After he meets with Kimball, he goes behind those orchards down to where Cedar Creek Grade Road is, where his men are, and says, boys, put on your bayonets. You're going to need them. All right, so no longer an artillery duel. Any questions about what's occurring here in the morning? And in the early afternoon, we're going to go down to where Fulkerson's attack's going to launch from, okay? So that's what we'll do next. We're going to walk through those buildings again, so if you need to make a bathroom stop, you got plenty of time for that. And then uh, what time's our lunch going to be here? Noon. Noon. What time is it now? 10 at 15 after 10. Okay, we're going to be able to do this easily. Yeah. All right. Thing, if you look, if you look right towards the warehouse with the green stripes, right below the corner, you see a little white platform. We're going to reassemble at that platform it's called Jackson's Lookout. It's brand new. And there's two brand new trail signs, and we'll start the discussion off there after lunch. After lunch. All right. <clears throat> All right, so the rest of our morning tour is going to be walking. We're going to go down. Fill in the wilderness. Well, we had three battles here. All right, we had the first battle of Kernstown, which is what we're doing today. We had the second battle of Kernstown, which actually occurred right here, uh, which will be covered uh, this summer on an annual tour. Scott Patchen, uh, will, um, my best friend and a great expert on it, will cover that and include what happens in that house. And there's a, the first day of the Second Battle of Winchester also occurred on this property. Winchester was a three-day battle. So we have three battles that occurred on this property and a huge skirmish, even bigger than the Third Battle of, uh, excuse me, the uh, Second Battle of Winchester in terms of this property um, occurred on August 17th, 1864. If I said Third Battle of Winchester, I admit my mistake. Second Battle of Winchester. First day, second battle, Winchester. First and second, Kernstown. August 17th skirmish. Huge engagements fought on, on these properties. This stone wall, it's the original stone. I think it's been readjusted. And back when Jed Hotchkiss sketched the area in October of 62 after the uh, Maryland campaign, the, interestingly, <laughs> the Pritchard's Lane ran on this side, on this side of the stone wall. Okay, and Hotchkiss makes mistakes on his maps, but I don't think he made a mistake this time. I think when they straightened these roads out for automobiles, they took advantage of where they could really do the best straightening, and I think that was probably the ground on the other side. So I don't think the wall actually, aside from getting repositioned, I don't think the wall ever moved, but I think the lane did. I think the lane went from this side to that side, okay? But it's probably the original stone wall. And in the second battle of Kernstown, Union troops will be positioned behind it. In the first battle, it was just a very, very temporary spot for Union troops. They actually went past it and further out. Did you all go all the way down? The it went all the way to the lane, yeah. all the way to Route 11 yeah. okay. back then, okay? Back in the day. So for the last time, came in here to draw the area. There was a, uh, um, probably a, it was a slave. Um, his name was Sam. And he said, uh, what's the name of this place? He said it's Hog Run. So that's why I think the Hog family is called the Hogs family. <laughs> but he thought it was named Hog Run because the hogs used to feed out of here. But the William Hog was the first owner of the property. He had a cabin probably that was just to the left of the Pritchard House um, in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s. He put a log cabin where the church stood back then. It's very interesting. My first trip to this area before I ever moved to Northern Virginia was 1991. And back then, the only thing you ever learned about Kernstown was from those old 1950s interpretive signs near the auto dealerships that used to be down Route 11. And so you'd look out there and that's what you did. Now, I did a lot of research on Kernstown when I lived in Wisconsin because they, next to the Library of Congress at that time, they had the second best newspaper collection. So I was accumulating a lot of stuff at that time and I finally got um, a guy who did a lot of metal detecting got me out here for the first time and got me to Sandy Ridge and the rest took off from there. So when I came out here in the, in the 90s and was leading a tour at the church, it all comes home again, William Hogue's great to the sixth granddaughter was getting married in that same church that day. Mm. Wow. You gotta like wow. that, wow. right? Wow. <laughs> great to the sixth.
Okay, we are south of the Pritchard's house, between there and Opeckin Church, as you see. We cross that main branch of Hogs Run. Um, and what I wanted to show you is you see the road curving down around Opeckin Church? That is what Apple Valley Road was back then. Today, see my finger from Macaulay? Yep. Today, the road actually goes straight from there to the Valley Turnpike. That didn't exist back then. There's a traffic light there today. You make a left or a right, depending on whatever direction you're coming from, you're on Apple Valley Road. GE plan and all the rest. But back then, the road actually started at the village where the only existing building that's there today, the Beamer Tavern, with the pillars in front uh, near the 7-Eleven, that's where it would have emptied out. So take a look at a Pritchard's Hill, and you see that stone wall in front of it that's running, it's very, very low. You see it kind of in the bushes at yep. the bottom. Mm -hmm. the, there used to, there still is interpretive signs there. Like I said, the only places you could do the Battle of Kernstown back in the day was to go there into the dealerships to read the signs and look out there and say, I wonder what it would be like to be on this property. Well, it took me a lot of years because I'm not a very bright person at times, I will admit. Um, as I tell a lot of people, I have a photographic memory and nothing develops. So, uh, so, what, so I would get to those signs and I'd be down at that side of the stone wall looking out at the property. And then one day, you know, when the aha moment finally hits you, because you're standing in, in almost a ditch, I'm standing in the old road. <laughs> and I didn't actually appreciate that. I just wondered what the heck this, this old... So that stone wall, I'm saying, is, a, is at least 200 years old untouched yeah. oh, wow. and if you're on the other side i'm saying when you have your leisure in fact going home today you might want to stop at 7-eleven get yourself a soda and then just for the heck of it go into the opec and church lot nice little cul-de-sac turn around in there right before the church walk out in front of the other side of the wall and you're going to stand right in that old road bed all right but today we'll follow the line of houses that was constructed follows the old road bed perimeter all the way to Apple Valley Road today. So it'll be easy to see from this point on, but that's what I wanted to show you there. All right. Map 5B. This is the driest that's ever been for me <laughs> coming out here <laughs> easily. Now I've probably been doing tours here since, uh, uh, well, before we even acquired the property, but um, uh, we, we first got uh, access to it as, as KBA, I think back in 97 or 98. And then we were able to make the full purchase a few years later uh, for 4 million and 88,000, a little change. I made, they had me help map out what to include in it. And this wasn't gonna be part of it, but I insisted that it was <clears throat> because I wanted the open land all the way to the road. And we even knew back then that the, there would be warehouses um that would eventually be put up on the other side there wasn't at a time this used to be all open and then those houses came up and we were very thankful that we got this one we did i'm gonna tell a quick story when um president scott gregory told us about how we raised the money we got an ice tea fund that collected a couple hundred thousand dollars of interest luckily it sat and sat for a while for us we also got uh, money from uh crep and i can't it, it was a it was an environmental fund Okay, uh, and essentially that was to keep cows from crapping into streams that would empty into the Chesapeake Bay eventually, right? So there's a lot of this, a lot of low, this marshy lowland ground. And I got a bad call from the past president, Larry Duncan, who said, Gary, you're not gonna like this. I, I said, what? He said, well, you remember how Barton's Woods goes all the way to the other side at one time? I said, yeah. He said, well, we're gonna make Barton's Woods and unfortunately we have to have it cross into this side because the agreement we had with CREP to get their $50,000 was that we would plant trees here, as well as high grasses, and I was really mad, right? <laughs> so I came out here one year, and I'm showing the group, I said, enjoy this for the last time, because all the tubes were already put up to protect mm -hmm. them from the deer, right? The, the saplings, but you're here today, and what don't you see anything of? You trees. see no trees, you know what happened? The deer could not get to the seedlings but they did push the tubes right over top of them and killed them all. <laughs> God is on our side, baby. <laughs> so, so we already got the money. It was all legit and it was a win-win. <laughs> right, so, so we still have our open view all the way to the road, which is always important. Whenever I have you guys try to find me a car that's going across, that's our focal point. 
So that's this road. This is Apple Valley Road, which back then would have would have come up to where this tree line, or where the houses start, and then it would have followed the outline of the houses around the church where I told you the stone wall or the stone wall is now, and would have gone right out at Kernstown, where uh, just north of where 7-Eleven is now, right at Hogs Run. All right. So that's what the that's the way Kernstown would have been configured back then, <clears throat> and. On the other side would be Barton's Woods. So, what are we facing ahead of us? We were already up there. That's Pritchard's Hill. From the warehouse area, that's about 1,200 yards, all right? And it is now about, we're backtracking to the Confederates, so I'm bringing this back a little bit. There's no Union, there's no Confederate artillery up on Sandy Ridge, which is out of our view. These trees would not have been here. But the fence line that surrounds them is this exact fence line that you see to the right of the word Macaulay. You see that dotted line? This dotted, see my fingers for the dotted line of Macaulay? That's the fence line that's housing these trees today. Okay? So where we're standing is roughly right about uh, where you see the word Second Virginia on the other side of the road. Follow your finger across, directly across from 2nd Virginia, and maybe just a little bit more to the left, and put it about a third of the way between 2nd Virginia and Macaulay, and that's about where we are. Okay? Make sense? Yep. On this side of the road. So, uh, warehouse is about 1,200 yards from the crest of Pritchard's Hill. Again, what do we see on the other side of Pritchard's Hill is that tree line, which is what Fulkerson's going to be aiming for. So, um... This is Jackson in his first day as an independent commander. And he's he's in got rough he's got a rough start just by the amount of help he's gonna have. Larry and I were talking about this, is that he has less uh, official staff help as a division commander at the first battle of Kernstown than he did as a brigade commander at the first battle of Manassas. There are fewer official aides here to help him. He has to pull some into service, including Major Frank Jones of the 2nd Virginia, whose home is Vaucluse, and his knows this area like the back of his hand. Not a bad aid to bring aboard, but he finds that a uh, uh, requirement for him. He's got Wells J. Hawks as his commissary officer. He's got Hunter McGuire as his <coughs> surgeon. He's got James K. Uh, Boswell as his engineering officer, and he has Sandy Pendleton, and that's it. Sandy Pendleton's doing like triple duty, what about, right? What about Jun uh, George Junkin is an, is an aide to camp and he's going to get captured here. Yeah. So after this battle, he'll have even less yeah, than that. Yeah. All right, so that's not very much staff help. And for some people, that, that famous ring of Jackson staff that we see in, um, in the Jackson Museum and you see uh, replications of it in, in, in anthologies of the Civil War and of the Valley Campaign. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that that staff, which is developing through this Valley of 62 campaign, is much less help to Jackson in 62 than they will be as the same staff helping out Dick Ewell in 1863 and Jubal Early in 1864. It's the same people, but they know this place so much better and they're more comfortable in their roles. They're actually more of a hindrance to Jackson at many times in 62 because they're doing things way out of their realm. I'll give you an example. Boswell, who's his um, uh, engineering officer, <laughs> wants to leave the command um, in May. Not like, oh, he's got John Harmon too as his quartermaster. Harmon's always having fights with Jackson. Uh, Boswell isn't, but he, he says, he writes to a friend, I want to mm. switch commands because there's nothing um, but topographical duties to be performed here. And as you know, I am a very poor draftsman. In other words, Jackson wants somebody to make maps. And Boswell is more of a plain kind of engineer and, and can scout out forts and those kind of positions for Jackson, but he doesn't want to do maps. So a lot of people don't appreciate that, but what will happen three days after this battle is as he's retreating into the valley, Jackson at the, at the McGinnis house will pull aside Mr. Jedediah Hotchkiss, no rank, we call him Major Hotchkiss, but he's not ranked, and he makes him his maps. I want you to make me a map of the valley. 
And I always say that he probably said that to Boswell first. And Boswell said something like, no can do Stonewall, or, or drew maps with stick figures on it, or did something kind of awful. But why in the world would Jackson want to hire uh, a, a civilian map maker when he's got a chief engineering officer? That's your answer. Boswell is going to be a great staff aide to Jackson. He's going to die at Jackson's side the same night that Jackson's hit by friendly fire. Boswell's killed by that same, that same volley. <clears throat> So he serves Jackson very well and, and, and gives up his life for him. But, but that's why Jackson has to hire um, Hotchkiss. So Hotchkiss isn't here for this battle. But when it comes to the second battle of Kernstown, and I'll come back to ours again, it's people like Hotchkiss that will take the Apple Valley Road, which he has sketched intimately from that stay he had here in October, and he will lead, it'll be Mr. Jedediah Hotchkiss that will lead Ramzer's troops to the base of uh, Sandy Ridge and, and do the flanking maneuver there. That's the kind of stuff that Jackson could have used in 1862 that none of these guys were able to do. But by 1864, they're doing it uh, almost like brushing their teeth. It's almost, uh, it's almost that kind of learned behavior that they do it automatically. Okay, makes sense? So in 1862, everything's kind of new. And for Jackson, he's kind of new. And he's going to make a lot of mistakes on this field. <clears throat> Here's the first one. He's going to come here, and he's going to scout out the position. And Jackson, we know, fights a lot of his battles on Sundays, even though he, he laments about it. But he's going to fight this battle. He's going to make the decision because he still is under the false impression that he, that he probably outnumbers his opponent. All right? Who has been here all morning long that could have told him otherwise? Ashby. Turner Ashby, who is less than half a mile from us. He's over where 81 is over there, maybe a little more than a half mile away. And if you read Ashby's uh, official report, you could kind of read between the lines and realize what didn't happen. Ashby will say something like, um, I learned of your arrival and soon received instructions to do this. What does that automatically suggest that didn't happen? There was no face-to-face -face meeting. I learned of your arrival and received instructions. It didn't say I conversed with you, right? So if Jackson had gone to Ashby and said, what, what do we got in front of us? Well, well, General, there's a whole brigade on the east side of the Valley Pike, which Jackson cannot see at all. There's no way he sees any of them, all right? The only thing that Jackson's going to see are those, are those uh, artillery pieces up on the hill. That should be kind of convincing if you see 10-pounder parents, parrots, uh, festooning that hill. I just wanted to use festoon in a sentence. I feel good about that. So they're up there. You would think that there's got to be a lot more than a couple regiments with them. And then you would have seen some of Kimball's brigade. So he's not going to see Sullivan and he's certainly not going to see Tyler behind the hill. All right. So that's why he still thinks he outnumbers his opponent. He's got one regiment that stays back at Newtown, Stephen City. That's the 48th Virginia, uh, 300 officers and men. Um, but the rest of his force is up here. All right, so Jackson's total uh, troops here, to about 3,700, roughly 2,800, 2,742 infantry, um, cavalry about 300, and about 700 artillerists. All right, we're going to get to the artillery in a few minutes. So he's moved his men through Barton's Woods from where Springdale is today, where the Barton house is, that 1754 structure. You guys ever see that? Really cool. You got to see the oldest house, one of the oldest houses in the valley. And then the old collapsed fort next to it. You ever go down 11 or up 11, look at that. George Washington as a 16-year-old surveying with Lord Fairfax stayed the night there. Okay, and that's, that's still there, all right? So, 1734. So, they're moving through. And Jackson doesn't lead with his own brigade. He leads with a demi-brigade, we'll call it, Fulkerson's Brigade. Colonel Samuel Vance Fulkerson, an Abington lawyer, 37 years old. He's got his own 37th Virginia, commanded now by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Carson. And he has the um, 23rd Virginia, commanded by Alexander Galt Tolliver. Looks like Tollifero, Tolliver. Um, and we know they pronounce it Tolliver because soldiers will write in their letters T-O-L-I-V-E-R. Mm -hmm. So we know exactly how they pronounce that name. Um, and it's his, uh, it's his nephew, William B. Tolliver, that becomes a Brigadier General. Uh, so Alexander Galt Tolliver, the uncle, is a Colonel of the 23rd. They're the ones moving through the woods first. Jackson will ride up to Fulkerson personally. 
and point out this position and say this is the union right and your job is to turn the battery we already talked about what what that is all right um, in the meantime Jackson's going to do a couple other things I'm going to have Larry come in and talk about moving the artillery in a second but I want to talk about what Ashby is when Ashby received his instructions Ashby's instructions were to feign on the Union left which is on the other side of the Valley Turnpike and there's a lull that occurs after this opening artillery fire before all this movement starts occurring at 2 o'clock and Ashby during the lull <clears throat> The captain of that Maryland company in the 7th Virginia Cavalry um, uh, had the commander, I love the name, Captain Thaddeus Thrasher, uh, is riding along and he sees a fox bounding in front of him. It's the old fox hunting day, so he starts chasing after it. It's a lull, right? But he really loses sight of what's going on because the fox is bounding toward the Union lines and Thrasher gets way too close, point of no return thinking he's going to bite it right here, but everybody, all the Union troops start applauding him. You know, they really love the entertainment. Thrasher goes back to Ashby and says, let me lead the advance, I know exactly where to go. All right? So when Ashby leads the advance, Thrasher's in, in charge of it. They get on, way out of our view. They get on the east side of the pike. They're going to get some pretty good people. Um, uh, William Harrow of the 14th Indiana, who commands a a division in the Atlanta campaign and a br brigade at Gettysburg. He's a, a darn good commander. Uh, Samuel Sprig Carroll, who will have the Gibraltar Brigade at Gettysburg. He's over there too. They repulse that feign because Ashby's version of a feign, he's so aggressive, is they literally attack. All right. And when the dust clears, there's um, uh, lots of horses down, six dead and wounded Confederates, or six dead Confederates, several more wounded, including dead on the field. That is Thrasher, the same guy who was cheered by the same troops that just killed him uh, just a few minutes later. Ashby has that command split. 140 of those men under Oliver R. Funston will go to the other side of Sandy Ridge. Anybody been to Dinosaur Land recently? Okay. You go a little bit south of Dinosaur Land on 340, looking off to the side, you see that, that lone, nice brick, brown brick house. And that's Funston's house. Mm. He's Ashby second in command and he's got those so he knows this area very well so He's got them over on the other side of the ridge. All right, we try to bring it home for the folks that know yeah, All right, yeah. so he's over there with 140 um, Ashby's got 150 minus what he's lost in that skirmish those four companies of Stonewall Brigade infantry have returned back to their infantry and they've moved out with Fulkerson So I'm about to talk about Fulkerson's charge. I've talked about the fane but what Jackson's ultimately doing is going to, he's going to be moving his artillery. Larry, why don't you set us up with what Jackson brought to the field on the pike and what he's moving. Okay, <clears throat> so when Jackson moves his, his forces up through Barton's Woods, down somewhere, we're not exactly sure, but probably in the front yards of where these warehouses are now to the southeast, is the reserve position in the artillery park. He puts five batteries there. The three that go to Sandy Ridge, McLaughlin's uh, Rockbridge Artillery, Waters West Augusta, and Carpenter's Allegheny uh, Artillery are in that park, plus the Danville Artillery and the Hamden Artillery. So five batteries. So he's, he starts the movement west to Sandy Ridge, and if you look at 5C, you can see towards the bottom, McLaughlin's battery leads with two regiments in between, and then the Waters battery follows. Um, Carpenter gets pulled up somewhere <coughs> just south of the church. I want you to pay attention to the geometry, what we call in the artillery, I'm an army artillery officer, pay attention to the geometry of the battlefield. This is the assault lane right here. East of us is an artillery position. You've got a convergence on the target, but the battery is not firing over the heads of the assault force perfect range about a thousand yards from the church to the hill carpenter actually puts two rounds into that barn that's parked where that gold pickup truck is where the slab was now the union infantry has kind of crept forward they crept forward and they they wind up a bunch of them in that barn that bank barn is no longer there so carpenter puts two rounds into the east door and scatters them back up on the hill 
and Jackson has kind of temporarily positioned his flag right beside the batter, and he's going, good shoot, yeah, good, yeah, good, yeah. keep it up, Claps good. And then he heads off to Sandy Ridge with his artillery. So the other two batteries are never engaged, the Hamden and Danville. So Mike and I, in our tours, we go, what, why? So not that it's history or actually, it's, it's our surmising and it allows us to tell a story that if they had been pulled forward, anywhere near where the, the uh, Carpenter's battery were, could have supported this assault and possibly guarded the right flank of Jackson's assault, but he never did that. Why? He didn't have a Philip Dom. He didn't have one. He was his own VMI artillery guy. He didn't have the staff. Right. And well, that... and when he gets when he gets that VMI guy, it's 26 year old Stapleton Crutchfield, and he's awful. He's uh, called by uh, uh, Henry Kidd Douglas, a descendant of the man who invented sleep. All right, so he, <laughs> he tends to be very lazy. Uh, some um, one of Dick Yule's staff said he's a competent but lazy officer. He turns to not even be competent at times. The proof of that. Two months later, at the first battle of Winchester, Jackson sent Stapleton Crutchfield off on a 22-mile mission to deliver a message at the start of the battle that requires, while they're putting artillery in, and who plants the artillery? Jackson and the the new head of the Stonewall Brigade, Charles Winder, who's also an artillerist, because they don't trust Stapleton Crutchfield anymore. So Jackson never was able to solve his cavalry issues, and he's never really able to solve who would have been the best artillery officer for him at that time. You also have the Pendleton family. Yeah, yeah. William's yep, not a whole lot. Yeah, even son, before. And Sandy is his age. So. And Sand, well, William, William is never considered yeah. the a brain, but Sandy no. certainly is. Sandy, yeah. Sandy was at UVA as a teenager, um, uh, in graduate school, I believe. But he was when he came out to help Jackson during the war. So, all right. So that's what's going on as Jackson's moving his artillery while we're now we're going to do the infantry assault that occurs here this piece that i'm about to talk about has been um undescribed in any anthology or description of this battle for 135 years after it happened and that is kind of interesting because it's not hidden in the official records it's definitely there and in fact there's an unpublished uh, report from uh dick garnett uh, we'll talk about him in a minute, that's at the Museum of the Confederacy, that also mimics exactly what's in um, Samuel Vance Fulkerson's account. And everybody just tends to, it's page 408 of OR volume 12. Ooh, photographic memory did come in place there. <laughs> All right, because I've seen that account so often. Uh, it's right there, and every historian that cho chooses to write about Kernstown has never really understood this, and so they decided not to describe it. In fact, this is a, whenever you go to the visitor center uh, at the end, you're going to want to take a look at the, the Hotchkiss original maps that are on the wall of this battle. He will have, and he misnames one of the regiments, it's actually the, not Hotchkiss's fault, it's the lithographer's fault. The 23rd and 27th is what's on the map, but it's the 23rd and 37th. On the Hotchkiss map, he has them doing this circuitous movement, almost like this little, uh, a uh, cropped lane that we have curving around to Sandy Ridge where they were intended to go the whole time. And that leaves you the impression that nothing happened here, that they were just leaving to go over to, to Sandy Ridge. All right, which always, even in the days when I was reading the signs at the auto dealerships and at Opeka Church, the first thing that popped in my mind is, why in the hell wouldn't they just go completely up and over Apple Valley Road, which at that time went up and over Sandy Ridge. You didn't have to do this and expose your flank to all those Union guns. So that never made sense to me. I found Hotchkiss's um, manuscript papers in the manuscript <coughs> division, not in the map division. And he had the sketch map showing exactly what you see in map 5B. Straight up, right angle out, which means what? A repulsed attack. And the lithographer simply smoothed it out it changed history for 135 years, and it became something that people just decided not to talk about anymore because they didn't have enough confidence of what really happened here. So now you're going to get that version of it, the real version, okay? So, Fulkerson's told to turn the battery. This is right from his report. 
So he will get the 23rd and 37th lined up in double column of division at full distance to shorten the frontage so that you don't take a lot of direct fire instead of that big line of battle that would just be too inviting, right? So the left flank will be near that tree line. The right flank, maybe 80, 80 yards each the man, takes up about a yard of space. And given the size of Fulkerson's uh, uh, companies of no more than 40 yards across or so, maybe 50, but maybe up to this road. So they would have been positioned a little bit over more to our left when they started their advance. Everybody's on foot except for Fulkerson. He's on a white horse. They tear down the wooden fence that's in front of this road. He doffs his cap. He's a former judge, like I said, lawyer and judge out of Abington. He says, boys, follow me. And they start pulsing out in this direction. Those two Virginia regiments, 600 officers and men, start heading out. We're about to go in there, do exactly what they did. Behind them, Fulkerson said he was going to get support. Jackson told him directly from the next brigade that comes up. The next brigade that comes up is Richard Brooke Garnett's brigade. Garnett is stepping into some big shoes. I think Jackson was what, size 13 feet? At least. But he was not a big guy. Jackson's 5'9 and 3 quarters according to his passport. But he had very big feet, okay? And, Garnet, and literally and figuratively, because Garnett is now in charge of the Stonewall Brigade and Jackson's been trying to get rid of him since January tried to get him replaced by Seth Barton of the 3rd Arkansas when the 3rd Arkansas was part of Jackson's command. So uh, that request was suppressed and Garnet's still in charge. So Garnet gets to the wood line, Fulkerson's men are already moving off, and Garnet is with the 33rd Virginia, the, the leading regiment of the Stonewall Brigade, and they're commanded by Arthur C. Cummings. Garnet will get his instructions not directly from Jackson, who won't even talk to him because Garnet was one of those ones in that last council of war that kind of had to tell Jackson your your plan for a night attack isn't going to work all right so Jackson even though he's maybe over where these houses are and Garnet's right here Jackson's sitting on his horse he won't come over and talk to him directly he sends Frank Jones with instructions to give to Garnet and tells him your orders are to support Fulkerson but he doesn't tell Garnet what Fulkerson's orders were all right. So as Garnet will legitimately complain to Inspector General Sam Cooper in the aftermath, I was left in as, in as profound ignorance as the humblest private in the army. All right. So he sees Fulkerson moving off toward that hill, and he and he even writes in his report, "I finally realized that Fulkerson's orders were to attack the hill," which is not true. But if you're Garnet, that's exactly what it looks like. So you have the 23rd and 37th Virginia heading out leaving a gap and then the 33rd is going to come out after so three regiments 27th or 37th 23rd and 33rd virginia 950 plus very brave virginians going into what is the teeth of the artillery position in an effort to get to that tree line so we're going to pick it up all right we won't line up exactly like they did but you're going to learn the cost of when all men from the same company are recruited from the same town, the kind of devastating effect that has. Any questions about this before? This is two o'clock, by the way, maybe 48, 49 degrees out here. Canopy of artillery rounds coming in our direction. They haven't found their, their um, the correct distance, but you know that you're heading into the teeth of that. So is it true that <clears throat> because Garnet only brought the 33rd, he was so confused in the orders that he forgot to tell his other yeah, right, now, in a, in a he's, the question he's asking, Garner's going to have seven charges leveled against him for neglect of duty at Kernstown. Most of those charges have to deal with Sandy Ridge, but the first two have to deal with down here. Thank you for bringing that up. The first charge is that, uh, is that General Garnet did not have enough regiments with, um, in support of the leading um, uh, brigade when it advanced to Kernstown meaning that he supported Fulkerson with just one regiment and left the other ones behind in the support. Garnet's reasoning, when he explained this before the trial, said, I saw Fulkerson attack with two regiments. I assumed that one regiment uh, support was a legitimate coverage for a two regiment uh, support. Why in the world would he attack with two regiments, only two regiments to begin with? And that's what he felt was his, his explanation. Technically, he's guilty because you're obligated as a brigade commander to support, even if it looks weird, 
to support a two regiment attack with four regiments. Now there is one Stonewall Brigade regiment, the largest one, the 5th Virginia, which is still back support, supporting the Sporting Danville artil artillery. artillery. Yeah, artillery. so Burke's Brigade, Jesse Burke's Brigade, which had the 21st Virginia uh, and the 42nd Virginia, and the 5th Virginia of the Stonewall Brigade, they're all back there. With Carpenter's Battery is the Irish Battalion, half a brigade, five companies of the 1st uh, Virginia. They'll follow Carpenter's Battery up on the ridge. So the rest of the Stonewall Brigade regiments, the 27th Virginia, the 4th Virginia, and the 2nd Virginia are still in the woods watching the 33rd move out. Okay? Uh, so that's the charge against Garnet. I don't think he would have got court-martialed for that, meaning cashiered, because there's Confederate officers are too valuable for that to be a problem. The second charge is really crazy, that, that when an aide went looking for General Garnet, he couldn't find him for 10 minutes. Do you know why? The aide went looking for Garnet in the woods, and, the, and, and they said, no, he's off with his leading regiment, the, the 33rd Virginia. And when that aide went back to Jackson and told him that, they could hear Jackson say, impossible, that he didn't believe what he was hearing. But that's exactly what Garnet was supposed to do. That makes the third charge even crazier. You ready for this one? Here's my segue, which has to deal on Sandy Ridge. That Garnet was not with his leading regiment when it became engaged with the enemy on March 23rd, 1862. The leading regiment that gets engaged on Sandy Ridge 33rd. is the 27th. Oh. But Garnet is with the leading oh. regiment. He's with the 33rd. Yeah. So he's supposed to be at two places at the same time. Mm -hmm. See see what Jackson's doing? Getting pretty petty about this, isn't he? So that's what's going on. The first charge Garnet definitely is guilty of, though. All the other six are explainable or, or nutty. <laughs> all right. So of the seven charges, the first one is, is the legitimate one. By not right? bringing all his brigades. Really. By not bringing all the regiments out. Regiment. But then again, his explanation to the inspector general, I was left in as profound ignorance as the humblest private, never told what the orders were. He could probably have worked his way out of that charge had the trial actually gone all the way through, which it never did. Well, and using the, basing the, the formation that they were using anyway, and then he comes out 200 yards behind Fulgerson, most of those guys wouldn't even have made it out of the woods anyway. Right, I mean, <laughs> the idea was if they were all in W, excellent point, Mike, because if take the length of the Stonewall Brigade minus the 4th Virginia, is about, let's see, two regiments had 300 apiece, the other two had 200, what is that, a thousand men, all right? A thousand officers and men spread out like that behind another 600, they're just, you would have still been in the wood line. Well, in the wood line, excellent point. I wish I had you for the book on that one. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. How old were you in 96? Uh, 13. You could have still provided some help. <laughs> you would end up in the acknowledgements. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna move out, all right? And we're going to follow Fulkerson's line of attack, and I'll start. I'll stop us when I talk about when it starts having its effect. All right. So imagine this. I mean, I don't. I don't want to um, exaggerate this too much, but if you're a soldier in these ranks, how is this going to be any different from Pickett's charge? Okay. Look what you're attacking. Ten artillery rounds, all training on you. How is it any different? All right. From what you're experiencing here on this field, it would be no different at all. It's just this. It's just magnified by the n number of troops that end up in it later. Soon to be 16 guns when you right. get close. Right, yeah, yeah, you're gonna, yeah, we'll pick that up too. All right? Yep. All right, follow me. Remember that whole story about um, the, the German artillerists leaving their pieces, our down bringing them back, they're lowering them? That's all occurring while we were just marching. And now we're getting about 500 yards or so with, to, the, to that crest. And now they're <laughs> feeling they're getting that positioning. Um, <clears throat> Right after my book was published, Murphy's Law, I found Alexander Gall Tolliver's memoir, the guy in the 23rd Virginia, who would say at this point he would raise his sword in the air, ping, 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 he's getting all the shrapnel mm. that's hitting his sword uh, as he's trying to wave his men on. So picture Fulkerson, who's still on his darn horse <laughs> going into this stuff. And now the men are really starting to feel it. You're starting to get, um, you're starting to get hit by these rounds, okay? now. Uh, the, the, if you're an artillerist, the best way to kill people is depending on what's coming at you. If they're, if they're coming at you front line, do you want to hit them with solid shot or exploding round? Exploding round. You want, you want to create as much mayhem as possible. When do you want to use the solid? If you're really skilled at it, like uh, Stephen D. Lee would be doing at 2nd Manassas, 
when they turn their flank on you, you want to knock them down like bowling pins. Mm. You'd have a screaming <laughs> round, hit the guy in the end, it would just shoot them all out. I don't think they were that sophisticated up there. I think they were firing whatever they had, which was shankles, and they had um, some Hostus, solid. Hostus yep, and they had the most, I think they mostly had solid rounds that they were throwing in there. But there definitely was exploding stuff because ping, 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 ping on the shoulder. I don't think, I don't think rifle fired. I mean, there is infantry up there, but they're not going to reach this position. Well, you right? mentioned the forensics in your research and previous tours that showed a lot of... Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that things. in a minute, yeah. So, <clears throat> they're still going straight. Remember, what is Fulkerson's goal? That, that line of trees on the other side of the little hill. All right? But even Garnet in his report says he sees all the infantry in front of the artillery. He sees a lot of troops. I mean, this is a... It's not like an undiscovered thing. They know that that is the Union right, but there's a lot of troops there, okay? So we'll go a little further and we'll talk about what happens next. Um, with the three regiments at full distance, column by division. Fulkerson's where the silo would be, not there at the time, right? Uh, at the head, and he realizes he can't go any further because these rounds are now starting to tell, all right? So this column of all the troops as Mike alluded to, would have gone, even with just those three regiments, thousand men, they're, they're spread out enough that it's much closer, the tail is much closer to the road than you would think even from where you are now. So the rest of Garnet's column still has to be in the woods. And this thing's already gonna be repulsed, all right? So Fulkerson knows he can't get there. And he will turn his men to the left and put them into a locust grove of tree, look, tree of locusts. Um, at the base of Sandy Ridge, and they will hide out there to escape the artillery fire. This is the time when Robinson's battery, as Larry has brought up, has now pulled off from the back of the ridge and is getting that converging fire on the knoll right near the middle road. It's starting to hit them, and, and as one of them said, they saw them scamper like a bunch of sheep heading in that direction. Now you're turning your flank, okay? Because everybody's going to start turning in this direction. They're not going to all go straight up to the silo and turn. They're all going to kind of turn in place and go that way. Hang on a second, Gary. Look right through this gap. Watch this UPS truck go through here in just a second. It, I saw it move. It should come into view. Uh, I hope so. Hope I'm not yeah, your doctor called. He uh, said that you yeah. have this propensity to see UPS trucks <laughs> 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 where they don't uh, exist, maybe. and they said they maybe need I'm you. Gonna... They they said they need to keep you off of Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a car come down through there. I thought it'd be a nice view for elevation of that ground. Oh well. It's called Amazonitis. He's always looking for the UPS oh. delivery. <laughs> all right, so they all so they all turn, okay? And again, if you're on a flank company. All your guys are recruited from the same town. You're going to take a, you're going to get creamed, and your hometown paper is going to see a lineup of all the of all the men that get hit by these rounds that are bowling people over. I think they're firing a lot of solid shot here too. Um, and the evidence for this is um, back when I was researching this, I went down to the Virginia Hysterical Society, as I call it, and there's Jackson's papers there, and it it actually has a nice account of not just the number of casualties like you could get in the OR reports, but the description of them. And as I said, for 135 years, none of this was ever told. And yet you read from these accounts, hit by shell, hit by shell, hit by shot, hit by cannonball, uh, broken lower leg, bro broken, uh, broken knee, uh, hit and knee, hit, hit and leg. And where was Fulkerson's brigade in the afternoon? Behind a, a shoulder high stone wall where there was no Union artillery. So we know that none of that happened over there, all right? And you can account for up to 80 casualties. This is a real, look, look here, up there, and now look behind you. This is a killing field. This is hallowed ground right here. Mm -hmm. um, killed and wounded 80 men from Fulkerson's brigade and some from the 33rd Virginia, which was more protected because they're closer to the road. They will take more of their casualties on, on Sandy Ridge. But most of the killed and wounded in Fulkerson's brigade is going to be here on this part that hadn't been described uh, for over 135 years. Uh, and for one company, I think it's Company F of the 37th Virginia, 24 members killed and wounded just in that one company. Hmm. And you could just imagine they were probably a flank company and most of those casualties might have been one round, right? either an exploding shot or, or exploding shell or 
a shot that bowled a lot of them down or a combination of a couple of couple of rounds. It probably happened all at once. We're going to go up through, Take. I'll let you guys look at that sign where you see a couple of brothers that were involved in this. Um, and then Larry's going to show us the new sign on the other side of the silo that shows that converging fire from Robinson's battery. It's good that he brought up Robinson's. It's going to be a nice segue for us because, like I said, through the course of the morning, Jackson has put his artillery up on Sandy Ridge, but he has never told his second-in-commands or anybody what his whole intent was. And Jackson, you'll find through his command, his leadership never devises a battle plan. He likes to see how it kind of develops on the field. Then you really need to have communication. Okay, Robert E. Lee's one of those ones that'll draw these probably over elaborate plans the day before a battle and they're all distributed and everybody has to talk about them. And you have to be here at this time and you gotta be here at this time. That's not Jackson style at all. And I don't, uh, I've studied Jackson for decades and I'm, I'm sometimes very impressed by this because I think there's a huge advantage to it. But it's all wiped away if you don't communicate the plan. All right. So when Jackson puts all that artillery up there, who's the most surprised person in the world? Richard Garnett, who has just convinced Fulkerson that they can't sit there on the base of the hill anymore. They're both turning back their commands to go back to Barton's Woods. And they look up to their right and what do they see? Jackson lining up their artillery. I say their artillery because their artillery technically is attached to each of their brigades. All right. So the Stonewall Brigade is supposed to have Carpenter's batteries from a company of the 27th Virginia. It is associated with the Stonewall Brigade. Jackson sends the 27th Virginia of the Stonewall Brigade up with Carpenter's battery. And he sends the 21st Virginia up with Waters battery. All of this out of their commander's view. Jackson definitely is doing a little, what we would call in uh, the, not using the, the term not used in the 19th century, but micromanaging, right? Uh, division commander just acting as a brigade commander and sometimes even as a artillerist or a regimental commander to, to line all that up. But I can't lose sight of the fact that by 3 o'clock up there he has somehow with mostly smooth bores has achieved what um, uh, Porter Alexander couldn't do at Gettysburg and that's suppression. He suppressed the Union position running out of ammo anyway by 3 o'clock making Kimball change what he was going to do. Now, here's the irony of all this. Who did I say was the third ranking officer in the Union Army? Nathaniel Prentice Banks. He is still in Winchester with Shields, four miles from us. And he says to Shields, they can, they're getting some signals wagged. And he says, this is three o'clock. Well, Jackson's got all this lined up. Banks says to Shields, if you don't have any problem with this, I think all you're facing is Ashby. I'm going to go join Williams and the rest of my command that's just left the valley. I'll take the train to Harper's Ferry and pick it up from there. Shields says, no problem at all. So <laughs> while Stonewall Jackson is battling Shields' division, Banks, very apologetically with tail between his legs, has to write to McClellan that night. I had no idea. I was uh, under the impression it was just Ashby out there. But he even gives the time. He says, I left Winchester at 3.15. Wow. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely amazing. All right, so let's go up. You'll see any questions about what's occurring here. I want you to really appreciate what these guys are going through. As I said before, this isn't uh, this isn't ten thousand men in Pickett's charge, but for the for the side, these Virginians are no less brave than they were. So, right? so at this juncture, the Confederate the South was not getting any artillery support. No, that suppression. There will be no, except for those couple rounds fired by Carpenter's battery. That they, then they wheel up there. And then Larry talked about the trunnion of the cannon taken out. Yeah. That was a mile and a quarter. I, I'm assuming that was a lucky shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the power of the shot, the fact that it could still do that damage at a mile and a quarter, is pretty impressive. That occurred just on the other side of the Massey property. It's kind of depressing because I've been here long enough on my trips. That Massey barn just collapsed maybe 10 years ago, right? Something it, like that. It, 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 was, it was an eyesore for many years, but it was our eyesore. We all loved the <laughs> fact that it was still there because it was an original uh, Kernstown battlefield thing that we could always refer to. It's no longer there. Uh, so that was going on. So the other batteries weren't being used. And my point is, um, uh, 
partial agreement with these guys. I think that one of those batteries had to stay at the road to keep things honest. You don't want to have your right turned while you're shifting everything to the left. So they should, he didn't have to engage every gun, but he had to have at least one battery in position because these guys could have picked up what exactly um, Chu's horse artillery had been effectively doing through the morning with those three, two of those guns were just little things. The third one, the Blakely, was an impressive gun, that English Jackson's, or Ashby's English pet, they called it, that gun with that ping ping sound to it, um, was doing a lot of damage early on. So a nice battery like the Danville artillery could have picked up what they were doing and, and kept firing from that position. Um, but he, he just chooses not to use uh, or, or leave in second in command in charge of the rest of that artillery and it stays unused. So the Union artillery were basically unimpended as, uh, yep. as far as firing yep, on Yep, because these guys aren't firing back. Yeah. They're just trying to get out of harm's way at this stage. So these guys are unopposed, right? Mm -hmm. The only art, the only Union artillery that gets some casualties is Davies Battery B that had moved further down the pike toward Kernstown and then vacated their position, causing Davy to resign uh, a few weeks later. All right, follow me. Joined the 23rd Virginia at the same time, the day the, the battle, the war started. They had Eubanks who were cousins of theirs, and the Eubanks also joined. They were all Company K. Okay. Company K, 23rd Virginia. They were in this assault. So last summer, uh, William Pettis IV asked me to uh, put a commemorative sign that he paid for up here at the end of this assault lane to commemorate what that family went through. And they went through what Gary is just described. Now, two uh, uh, of the brothers um, died in this assault. And so we put a we put a new trail sign we'll walk up to. So that their story is that in during this assault, artillery fire killed those two men, and a third brother, second Kernstown, was in, mm -hmm. in the records, was killed at second wow. Kernstown. See, I didn't know that. Very yeah. Good. By the way, look back there again. They I have no evidence that they weren't interred on the battlefield and then reinterred. They could there could be some bodies out there. There's, there's not a record. We know what happened with the bodies up on Sandy Ridge, but um, uh, in the burials, I'm oh, sorry, in the burials, they could have easily uh, buried them right where they fell out here, the ones that were dead. Sign here is if you stand, you look down the assault route of Fulkerson and Garnet, you look up to Sandy Ridge, I mean, uh, to, to Pritchard's Hill, and then you look this direction for Robinson's battery direction of fire to simulate <coughs> the convergence of the infantry assault and two directions of Union artillery fire. This is why Fulkerson reached the point where if he went any further, what kind of ammunition was he going to be facing? Besides musket rounds was canister, devastating to an infantry assault. So he had to turn and move this way. So the Pettises the Pettises, back in May of 61, joined the 23rd, and uh, James Francis Eubank was captured, and John Overton and his uh, cousin Philip Eubank were killed in this assault. Coming up here. The whole story is here, if you want the further detail. But, but the reason this is here is to show the assault and the convergence of two fires. You see Good the, spot. You yeah. see the high ground where the churches are over yeah. there? That's where Rob, Rob, Fulkerson was, or Fulkerson, Robinson's battery was up on one of those knolls. You see how this, the terrain is sort of like a, a, a it decreases in altitude from that down to here. It's like a bowling alley. This is all pushed up for this barn, so it's a little, little deceptively high. But this was all down in this creek bottom as they moved through here. It gave artillery, even the short range howitzers and, and uh, small caliber that uh, Robinson had was effective at about 600 yards. It, they were still very accurate out to this range. And the infantry fire. Yeah, and then the infantry the fire, fire was the down on the, the bottom hill. of the hill. They could, long range muskets could shoot this far. Another good point to bring up here. This leads us <clears> in for the afternoon. So you got Robinson's battery repositioned and now kind of on its own, right? And the, the northernmost battery on Pritchard's Hill that Jackson's placed opposing Carpenter's battery behind, right about where the yellow house was, where the highway unfortunately is now, all right? 
So those are two opposing batteries sticking out more than any other. Sometimes battles happen because of mirroring movements that are, were unplanned. So what you're going to find in the afternoon, this big battle that's going to occur in this very compact 400 yard by 200 yard box in which more than a thousand men are going to be killed, wounded, or, or eventually captured trying to flee from there, um, is all going to be instigated because Jackson is going to send a regiment in an effort to capture Robinson's battery. And why is he going to do that? You want to repeat the ingredients of a previous success. What was Jackson's previous success? Henry House Hill, 1861. Remember Griffin's battery? The 33rd Virginia wearing blue uniforms. They, they were able to capture that battery. So here's a battery that can mimic that kind of thing where Jackson could send a regiment out to capture them. So that's why he's got, that's why his infantry doing something more than supporting artillery up there. The Union infantry, which is going to be 10 times larger because it's going to be 2,300 men instead of 230 in the 27th Virginia, they're on a mission too. That's to capture Jackson's artillery. So two missions to go after artillery and they're going to bump into each other at that stone wall and that's going to initiate the battle. We'll talk about that if, uh, when we get up on Sandy Ridge uh, after lunch. All right. Any, take your time reading the sign, but any questions about what, what's occurred between January 1st, 1862 to 2 p.m., 3 p.m. on March 23rd? We're good? We're good. Real quick, so the Union, the Union infantry, they were entrenched? They had Not entrenched. They don't do any entrenching until um, 63, yeah, the chances are. But, the, the but they're, they're, they're hugging the ground. There's an 8th Ohio account that, would, that was uh, writing about Company E of the 8th Ohio. Whenever one of Jackson's rounds would, would fly overhead and hit the ground around them and not kill anybody, they would stand up and start cheering because nobody was killed. But they're hugging the ground for dear life when, when he's got the suppression yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. Before that occurs, there, there are so many units there. The 84th Pennsylvania is there. The 5th Ohio is there. Seven companies of the 67th Ohio are there. Um, and I believe even some of the 13th Indiana is going to come across the Valley Pike. There's swarms of Union inf infantry kind of hanging around that hill. Before they're hugging the ground, if, if they were, I don't have any of their accounts that actually claim this, but if Fulkerson kept trying to head toward that grove of trees, he's going to get pummeled by infantry fire as well as the canister that Larry was talking about. Yeah. On this sign, I found a, a piece of artwork, pencil drawing, that sim replicates what the regiments in their formations would have looked like coming across rolling fields. I reversed it to, to fit the direction, uh, but that's what that piece of artwork is on there for, to sort of look like a, an infantry square coming across the, uh, in, in close, uh, what do you call it, column by division. Yeah. Best I could. <clears throat> wow, nice job. The real art's turned around. <laughs> <laughs> yep, take a look at it. Take your time and take a look. right flank and from this point he dispatches his aides as Gary alluded before to run over to his brigade commanders and tell them just that like Fulkerson I want you to to uh, turn the batteries and uh, now I will say just that Jackson did tell Fulkerson directly okay. that, one. that was Jackson directly All right but anyway Gar this is where Garney gets the aide to run over and say you will support Fulkerson yeah. and what does that mean so at this, from this point, on this sign, we we lay out as Gary did in his book. We lay out his thought process. Okay, it's Sunday. Uh, the enemy may reinforce himself if I wait. Uh, and uh, I've only got uh, I've got a lightweight. Uh, don't have a full strength, but I don't think they do either. So uh, I'm going to attack. And he just makes his mind up. 
and uh, from here he'll uh, he'll go back and gather up the uh, uh, Waters battery, the uh, regiments in Barton's Woods, and uh, start moving them off to the to Sandy Ridge to begin the, uh, which eventually results in the, in the artillery suppression mission from Sandy Ridge. So this that's the that's why we put this look out here, so you get the uh, you get the perspective of that general. Hmm. Now remember what his mission is, right? Spelled out by Joe Johnson. Get as close as prudence will allow, right? That means. Don't get compelled, and as Johnson explained later in his memoirs, I didn't want him to get close enough to be compelled to fight, and Jackson's going to decide to fight anyway. Now, here's how history gets turned in interpretation that's unsupported and goes way beyond the pale and gets very uh, popular. What a, what's the what's the almost the parenthetical statement when we always say Kernstown was Jackson's first defeat, um, uh, uh, tactical defeat, but. But it was his strategic victory. So you often hear that. That would be like me saying that Chancellorsville was Joe Hooker's tactical defeat, but it was his strategic victory because he knew that he took Stonewall Jackson away, it would force Lee to, to turn his two corps into three corps and give Lee this false impression that he was invincible on the offensive when he went up into Pennsylvania. Now all that happened, yeah. but why can't we call it a strategic victory? Because he didn't plan it that way, obviously, right? I just I use a very exaggerated, ridiculous example. But in this case, it's almost that way too. Would you like how would you like to be Joe Johnson and Stonewall Jackson says, you know, I know you told me not to fight. But I attacked because uh, I knew, because what, what, why is it Jackson's strategic victory? Because the, the Union overreaction, to turn to the last page of this book, is that they're going to send scores of thousands of troops into the valley in the immediate aftermath of Kernstown. And to call Jackson strategic victory is to say, I attacked to do that, which would be crazy to, in its concept. Jackson was not a strategic thinker, I'll get to that in a minute, but he actually, and I don't want to get biblical here, he denied it three times, okay, and his, <laughs> and his after battle report on the stand against uh, Garnet, they, and he, he admitted that he didn't do the re reconnaissance, and he, the reason he attacked is because he thought he outnumbered his opponent and he thought he could win. He didn't have any grand strategy in mind that he was going to attack because he knew the outcome was going to be that the Union War Department was going to overreact to his presence and and rather than prevent troops from leaving, going to send all these troops into the valley. Now, as a result of this, the Confederate War Department, of which they don't get enough credit for, people like um, uh, Jefferson Davis, is going to say, hey, look what just happened in the aftermath of Kernstown. Let's use Jackson as our tool to accomplish grand strategy later in this campaign, and, and we could do what happened by hap happenstance later by grand strategy planning, and that will be the effect of what happens at Front Royal and Winchester. And Jefferson Davis doesn't get enough credit for that, but that was why we turned this happenstance overreaction into something more by grand planning. As far as Jackson not knowing grand strategy, this is a very telling statement out of Jackson, which I, I like to quote a lot because it, it's him being honest and him being great Jackson, too. He is leaving... He is leaving the Shenandoah Valley on May 6th from Stanton on his way to pick up Allegheny Johnson's Army of the Northwest, that whole thing about the Battle of McDowell. And remember, Dick Yule isn't quite connected with Robert E. Lee yet, but is over on um, uh, where Elkton, um, Virginia is now, right? Conrad's store. And they're going to collect all their forces and go after Banks when they come back, right? As Jackson's leaving to go into the Alleghenies on May 6th, He's writing to uh, that favorite sounding board I mentioned before, Confederate Congressman A.R. Bodler, who talked him out of resigning a few months earlier. And he says, uh, I would like to see a strategy. He says, I have nothing but the utmost confidence in General Lee and believe that he has all that, done all that he could do for this valley. But I would like to see adopted for a moment a strategy in which we take our troops from one section, reinforce troops in another section, beat the enemy in that section, return to the section that we originally came from, and defeat the enemy there. <clears throat> but General Lee sees things from a higher standpoint than I. I know comparatively little outside my district. So he is admitting that he doesn't do anything by grand strategy thinking that we all used to give him credit for, 
Um, I mean, and, and and so he's telling us not to do that. But what I love about the comment is that he's doing that on the operational level, isn't he? I'm going to abandon one section of the country, go into the Alleghenies, defeat the enemy, come back to the section previously abandoned, reinforce and, and go after the enemy there. So what he's talking about that he can't do at a grand strategy level, he's going to do within the uh, confines of his district and do it masterfully. So that's what's kind of interesting about Jackson when we take him at his word, which we should do there, is that he definitely isn't doing anything here thinking about a big picture. He's doing everything on can he win the field and let the let the War Department take it from there whether he can or can't. Okay? But isn't, isn't this a great site for this? This would have been the edge of Barton's Woods. This road would have been here at the time. This is where Samuel Vance Fulkerson in front would have had the fence knocked down and rode out in front and doffed his cap and said, boys, follow me, it would have all occurred right here. It's a great spot. And uh, we called uh, nature.com before the tour to get the, the blooming started for you guys. So we worked out. We need all the Bradford going. pairs we can get. Yeah, we got a lot of stuff going in our direction. Yeah, all right, so that, now we're going to ride over to um, uh, the Rose Hill Park. And we're going to go via Jones Road off the back end here. So what, should I just leave that? We'll just go in the car. Yeah, we on, 6B. 6B. And you, it'll show up on 6C as well. So you see Colonel William Glass house, which we just passed up there. We're probably right about here, where the edge of my key is right now. And we're going to walk out to where the stone wall is, okay? So we're right about where I have my key, and we're going to walk basically east from there, okay? And we're going to pick up this opening action. So where do we leave off at Pritchard's Hill? At the end, Jackson's got his artillery in position, um, three batteries, repeated that in greens of a previous success. But how did he turn a southern defeat into a southern victory at Manassas? There stands Jackson like a stone wall, whether it was set in derision, which I'm not thinking it was. Uh, the truth was he got 13 guns up on Henry House Hill and everybody rallied around him. He now has anywhere from 13 to 15 guns, depending on how many Carpenter actually had up there, in position suppressing the Union artillery on Sandy Ridge. Those Confederate guns are about three quarters of a mile behind me and Jackson is, um, those guns are doing such damage to the Union position that Colonel Tyler, Erastus B. Tyler, is going to have that 3rd Brigade of Kimball's force, 2300 men, going on a circuitous move down Cedar Creek Grade Road, so which still exists today, Route 622 I believe. So from Burger King down to Cedar Creek Grade Road, he'll angle in right where 37 picks up from the Cedar Creek Grade Road, and he'll have his men in a pack column, which I'll talk about when we get there. The only infantry that Jackson has on Sandy Ridge is what was supporting those three batteries, and that's just two regiments. The 27th Virginia of the Stonewall Brigade and the 21st Virginia of Burke's Brigade. Now what you got to realize is that winter was not a healthy winter mindset wise for Jackson's troops. The Burke's Brigade was Loring's old command and they hate Jackson's uh, brigade. They call them Stonewall's pets, Jackson's pets. So they hate the Stonewall Brigade because they got to get out of Romney uh, really early in that campaign and they had to petition behind Jackson's back to do it. They thought Jackson was um, favoring them all the time, wouldn't put them in the hardest of the marches or the toughest of the fights. And they would hiss and, and hoot at Jackson when he was having a division review, those kind of things. So 21st and 27th didn't get along very well at all, not because the regiments in particular hated each other, but they were part of those two different armies which never considered themselves unified. What unifies an army? A battle. Mm -hmm. So you're going to learn that these two regiments are going to get along afterwards. By the way, the 21st, uh, this day is commanded by Lieutenant Colonel John M. Patton. <laughs> this is the Patton brother, one of the Patton brothers that lived, right? There are four Pattons that fought in the, uh, in the Civil War. Uh, uh, Tazewell, George Tazewell, who died at Pickett, or mortally wounded at Pickett's Charge. Uh, George S. Patton, the grandfather of World War II Patton, um, uh, mortally wounded at Third Winchester. Uh, there was a Patton brother that was a VMI cadet, and then there was John M. Patton, who uh, will dwindle down to about 128 pounds from dysentery 
throughout this campaign and he's going to resign I think in August due to that. Very um, uh, effective lawyer uh, in pre-war and post-war days. Uh, finally, before I go on, we're on the western side of Sandy Ridge on that high ground in the back there. That's where Oliver R. Funston will have half of Ashby's Cavalry. Remember Funston has a house near Dinosaur Land yeah. today? All right, he has half of Ashby's Cavalry, about 140 officers and men over there. Ashby still has the other half, minus Thaddeus Thrasher, unfortunately now, on the, uh, on the Valley Pike side. And that's where they'll stay through the day. Now, in a rarity in the Civil War, the Union Cavalry, by the end of this battle, is, out, is gonna outperform the Confederate Cavalry at this side of the field, which we'll bring up at the end of the day here as well. All right, follow me. Hello, Kernstown, Frank Leslie's art, um, uh, artist um, uh, was here. And he shows you what this would have looked like back then, much clearer. You would have had a view up to the stone wall. You can see the Confederate flags, the regiments behind the wall. This is the Union troops after the thing had started and they've kind of spread out. All right, so that kind of shows you um, the layout of this. And, and you, I actually found a, um, a Wheeling, West Virginia newspaper account where the, the, uh, the author is a soldier and he said, Frank Leslie's artist has been behind us the whole time sketching the field. And that would have been this Edwin Forbes. Mm -hmm. So this sketch is at the, at the Library of Congress. So that's what it would have looked like instead of this brush that you see now, it would have been a much open view. All right, so we're gonna go now to where Tyler's men came from the woods up here. 6B. And you turn it so that it's upside down. And you see the 7th Ohio regiments in a double column by division, meaning two company frontage. We would be pretty close to where the, um, where the uh, uppermost companies are. So the, so the two little icons, uh, as you have the map turned upside down, just above the 7th and 7th would be where we are now. Okay, got it? So each regiment is 10 companies. Uh, the column by division is a packed column to get them through woods. It's not a fighting column. You can't fight like that, right? So your frontage is 90 yards across, essentially, because the average company size of a Union regiment here this day is somewhere in the 40s. So 40 to 45 men. I actually got returns on 26 companies of Union troops here. You, sometimes the strength reports are difficult to come by, but by two different methods, I estimated that there were 6,000 to 6,300 Union infantry here this day, not at this point of the hill, but at the battlefield. And we already told you a thousand of them were never engaged, so there are about 5,300 infantry engaged on the Union side. On the Confederate side, what's the number I keep quoting? 2,742. It's probably a little higher than that, but the point is, what's the, what's the disparity? What's the ratio I just gave you, roughly? Almost perfect, but what is that ratio? What? About two to one. Two to one. All right. So military doctrine. This is the. These are the questions you got to ask yourselves when you're exploring battles and trying to answer questions. Um, you know, uh, if the military. What's the military doctrine that if you're in a defensive position, behind a stone wall with artillery support, what kind of numbers do you have to throw against that to expect to dislodge it? Three to one, at least. At least, that's the key. Three to one, comma, at least. Thank you, Larry. So never are you supposed to win with two to one. If you win with two to one, something happened to defy military doctrine. And that's really what a battlefield investigation should be for. That's what I do with the Quantico Marines when I used to take them out here, say, what is this really about? Why? Because that happened. We defied military doctrine. The old way of explaining First Current Sound is Jackson was simply overwhelmed by too many men. Yeah, there were two, it was a two to one disparity, but it still favored Jackson. You all understand that, right? So something happened to defy military doctrine, and that's what we're gonna do here, because if we don't answer that question, none of you people will be able to get any sleep tonight. I know that. <laughs> so we're gonna answer that question. You guys are gonna sleep well. You're gonna sing Kumbaya together on a return trip in the cars. Life's gonna be good. Dogs and cats are gonna get along in your neighborhoods. I can't tell you the wonderful things that are gonna spout from all of this. All right, so here comes Tyler, coming out of the woods, 2,300 men, 7th Ohio, 7th Indiana, 1st Union Virginia, 1st West Virginia, 
uh, 29th Ohio, 110th Pennsylvania. Packed column. And Tyler's got experience in the West Virginia campaign of um, 61, early 62 in the Romney campaign. He had experience. What's out there? Two regiments, one at a time. The 27th Virginia, no, uh, even though they, they probably number no more than 230 officers and men total, coming from their support of Carpenter's Battery, of which was formerly a company of that regiment, okay? That's why the 27th Virginia is smaller than the rest of them. They're always missing a company. They're on a circuitous mission to capture Robinson's Battery. Remember that whole story I told? Mm -hmm. And the 2,300 men here are after Jackson's artillery from behind. That's the unique thing about this, is two opposing forces on the same mission with almost a perfect 10 to 1 disparity in the size of the troops that they're sending on that mission, right? So, if you're the 27th Ohio, you're coming, or excuse me, 27th Virginia, you're coming up over the top ground, 150 yards away from us would have been that shoulder high stone wall that you saw in the Forbes sketch. They would have detached two companies as skirmishers. One of those companies is the Shriver Grays. They descend down into what is, this was a ravine, not a track now, but a ravine. And then they would go up into the woods, fanned out. The Shriver Grays, I think they were company, a, a company G of the 27th. They're from Wheeling, Virginia, all right? They start bumping into the column of skirmishers in front of Tyler's brigade, including companies A, uh, which is mostly company A of the first Union Virginia, the first West Virginia. Guess where they're from? Wheeling. Wheeling. Yeah. So at 100 yards apart, these guys are shooting at each other. Former neighbors, perhaps never friends from Wheeling, right? But if you're John, I love the name, John Buford Lady, <laughs> Lieutenant of the Shriver Grays, if he knew who he was firing against, he would have been less interested in those wheeling boys in front of him and more interested in the 3rd Regiment back because in that packed column of, of Tyler's brigade is the 1st West Virginia. And in the midst of that column is Company E. And in Company E are David and Columbus Lady, his two brothers. Mm -hmm. It's brother versus brother here, okay? And also, William Robertson of the Shriver Grays is fighting against John and Clegg Robertson, who are in the skirmishing companies. All right? We, at the end of the, we'll get ahead of the game here. At the end of the day, John Buford Lady gets captured. And I don't know if he ever has a bitter, sweet reunion with his brothers or not before he becomes one of the first invited guests of Fort Delaware Prison. Okay, the prison just opened and Kernstown captures are some of the first people sent there. But I do know what happened to poor Robertson. Uh, William Robertson, the Confederate, survives this battle only to have his leg severed by an artillery shell at the banks of Cedar Creek on the retreat. And he dies minutes before his two brothers enter the town. So the last reunion that the Robertson brothers had was when they were firing at each other from 100 yards apart, right here on Sandy Ridge. Brother versus brother. Hmm. It actually happened. And back in that day, I had to roll through microfilm, census films to, to find it, but I found it. It's exactly what happened, all right? So that's what's going on here, all right? Um, the Shriver Grays go back over to their commander, Colonel John Eccles of the 27th Virginia, and they said, Colonel, we saw five flags. Now, that's the line they gave them that they really would have seen would have been 10 flags, right? The national and regimental standards. And what Eccles knows is that he's, his single regiment is gonna be facing off against a brigade. So he lines his 230 men on a single file along that whole line of stone wall up there and awaits for these guys to approach. So if you are the commander of the Union Force here, you got your guys in this packed marching column, and you know that the only thing keeping you from capturing, you could hear that artillery booming over there, we'll get the carpenter in a second, is that, uh, is this line of one regiment in front of you, what do you do with your column? You break them up. You, you put them in a, in a formation for battle, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have to be five regiments in a line, but it better be at least three of them, right? Mm. To overwhelm that column with two regiments in reserve. And Rastus Tyler can be the hero of the Union and end the Civil War right here on March 23rd. Because even though Stonewall Jackson is going to get away, none of his cannons will, right? And that, and that campaign's gonna be over. Well, 
we kind of know that there's a campaign that we all study, so something else happened, didn't it? You know what Tyler did? He said, charge bayonets, and they just all pulsed forward in their marching column, and they didn't separate out, and they initially get pummeled by these 230 men who are enfilading both flanks and, and just kind of hold these guys in place and friendly fire as they start ascending troops from the 7th Indiana accidentally shooting into the backs of the 7th Ohio. That's causing more mayhem. And now there's going to be a third source of mayhem that Larry's going to talk about regarding Carpenter's battery. If, if you step out here on the lane, if you look up towards the power lines. We're going to go there too yeah. later. Well, we just describe the terrain. This is, a, this is like a swale. The, the Gary mentioned this morning that the Sandy Ridge was a plateau. Well, the road and the power line kind of cut through it. And you but hear that was where a the road plateau. is. Carpenter had two of his guns, we think he had four, uh, six pound iron guns from Tredegar, two of them pointing down this valley. Two of them pointing towards uh, Pritchard's Hill and two of them pointing this way. When Tyler comes out of this formation, that's an enfilade engagement of about 150 yards. I mean, you talk about solid shot targets. You're shooting right into the end of a of a pack column. Solid shot. They did have exploding shells, but they weren't. I mean, they weren't like a 12 pounder. But it, but they could rake. And they talked about um, when Tyler comes out of the woods, the limbs crashing in the trees and right. falling from the artillery I fire. They, I think they all were fight. They didn't yeah. get that. They didn't get that kind of devastation because they were all over firing high, which caused more confusion because of what was happening in yeah. the back. Yeah. yeah, so you've got, not only you got it facing a frontal assault of rifle fire behind a wall, but you've got enfilade fire of cannons. And uh, yeah, you walked right into it. And what that did was when that crashed in the limbs of behind me, that upset the 3rd Regiment, the back companies of the 3rd Regiment, the 29th Ohio, and it certainly spooked out the 110th uh, Pennsylvania, which had a reputation of uh, of um, shirking duty and stealing things and uh, running away from battlefields. Although they actually end up performing very well here after they collect themselves. But when you when you write a regimental, like the guy did for the 29th Ohio, and in the introduction of the regimental, you say, boys, know who you are. You are not the 110th Pennsylvania, followed by laughter in the introduction. You know that you're not talking about a, a regiment that was highly regarded, even though it ended up in Fox's 300. There's a guy associated with KBA who got so mad at me every time I tell that story, because um, <laughs> he had an ancestor on 110th and I wouldn't blame him, but I got to tell the truth. They weren't, weren't, very, uh, weren't a very highly regarded regiment, but I think they pick up their act later in the war. Well, those limbs uh, crashing down there take out half of that brigade and send them into the tree line and make them unaffected for the, for the next hour. The rest of these guys, until they get themselves out of that pack column, are gonna be equally ineffective. They try, Tyler tries leading some men off to the left, but they're beaten back by some elements of the 27th that are firing in that direction. And they start to dis, discombobulate on their own hook, right? They try to move themselves out of formation. Um, the commander of the 27th Virginia, John Eccles, a Falstaffian in appearance, he's, he's 275 pounds on a mountain on a horse on a hill. Do you think he's long for this battle? Nope. Shot in the shoulder and he's out. His next in command, Andrew Jackson Grigsby, who essentially has the same role that Jackson does in the valley in terms of handling this whole division at the Battle of Sharpsburg or Antietam, very capable commander, is there. And then the third commander of that is the Major uh, Frank Paxton, Bull Paxton, who also becomes renowned as a brigade commander. By the way, if you have a if you have a battlefield street named after you on a battlefield, it's usually not good for you. All right, but you know Paxton Lane at Chancellorsville, that's where Bull Paxton was killed. Anyway, that's he was leading the Stonewall Brigade at that battle. So, so there's good leadership in the 27th Virginia, but that regiment is getting beaten back by the numbers here. And suddenly, from nowhere, coming up on their side, let's do it, guys. Da -da 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 it's the 21st Virginia with John M. Patton in charge, sent by Jackson to reinforce the 27th. And now those 230 men, which are dwindling under 200, now reinforced by 250 more. Those 450 men secure that hill 
and hold that position so that these 2300, which have already been cut in half by the, by the confusion in the back, are now very well neutralized, all right? So that's, that's the story about the initial 15 minutes of this fight. So what happens now is that he couldn't get to these guys by moving on the, on the Union left. He now is going to try to outflank them by moving on the right. And he's going to go, Tyler will go to the 3rd Regiment line, which will be the 1st West Virginia, commanded by Colonel Joseph Thoburn, <coughs> who will play a big role later in the war, gets killed at the Battle of Cedar Creek, for example, leading division and brigades at times. And he will do, and beat him by 17 months, what Louis Armstead did at Gettysburg. He will put his cap on the tip of his sword, and we're going to follow his route as he leads his men over in that direction. Okay, but before I close here, what's going to happen through this whole fight, we're going to go over there, then we're going to come back here and pick up the end of it over on that side. So we'll skirt right back here again. You will have this compact fight in a, what amounts to a 400 yard by 200 yard box that will create noise unheard of before in this part of the valley. People in Winchester start climbing up on the roofs to see if they can see what's going on out here. And people at Pritchard's Hill that have been firing sporadically stop and say, my God, listen to that or listen to that musketry. Even Stonewall Jackson, a veteran of the first battle at Manassas and of the Mexican War, writes to a confidant a few days after this battle saying, I do not recollect of ever having heard such a roar of musketry. So this had a great impact on everybody involved in it. Uh, by the time it's over, anybody to a man in the Stonewall Brigade will say that this was a harder fight. Um, uh, this was one of their hardest battles of the war, certainly harder than even at uh, Manassas. And their casualty rate of 25% will, will attest for that. But I'm going to give you one account, um, which is really astounding. This comes from a member of the 29th Ohio. He's writing to his father just um, uh, 10 days after the battle describing what it was like to be in a battle and all the romance of a Civil War battle are done from what you can hear about this description. He said, um, in the excitement of battle, I could aim at them as coolly as they ever did at a squirrel. He's talking about fighting right about here. But now it seems very much like murder. They would raise up their hands and fall almost every time we got a fair shot at them. And then we would laugh at their motions and make jest of their misfortune. I can't imagine now how we could do it. The fact is, in battle, man becomes a sinner and delights in the work of death. And if his best friend falls at his side, he heeds it not, but presses on, eager to engage in the wholesale murder. Amazing, isn't it? it sounds like Vietnam. Yeah. But he's talking about one of the first battles of the Civil War, and that's what's occurring here. All right, so we're going to pick up now with uh, our friend Joe Thoburn with the, ho with the ha hat on the top of his sword and we'll see what happens over at the stone wall. Remember, if he gets over to that part of the stone wall, what will he do with his regiment? He will completely enfilade that position. Pressure in the front, pressure in the side, still a chance for a Union victory pretty quick on this. Thoburn and about 150 members of the 1st Union Virginia, 1st West Virginia. To this day, I have yet to figure out how they got here, but the troops that end up opposing him, you've met them before on Pritchard's Hill and in front of it, yes, Samuel Vance Fulkerson's brigade. The 23rd and the 37th Virginia worked their way onto this hill, cut across uh, diagonally, and ended up right here. Those two regiments that took the 80 casualties in front of Pritchard's Hill are going to be in the midst of this big time action and they will plant themselves right here. This is the reconstructed, artificially reconstructed part of the wall that we're looking at now. Right when Thoburn's men are coming in. So if you look at map 6C, we are right where that Fulkerson and Brigade men are standing. We're right here, the two regiments. We're right at the wall, you see that? Mm -hmm. And we're facing poor Joe Thoburn and a member, a Lieutenant Orr of the 37th at the turn of the last century, not uh, the most recent century, uh, recalled, I do not remember if I hurt anyone during the war or not, but if I did, it was on this occasion. Because these guys all have smooth bores, which we always say, oh, well, that's a disadvantage. Not in this battle, 
Because remember what I said, most of your firing is really close range. And you get that shotgun effect, buck and ball. These guys all have their guns at, at shoulder level, right, leveling them on the wall. And on unison, they're all firing at poor Joe Thoburn in the first Union, Virginia. 25 men go down right away, including Thoburn. Three bullets rip through his clothes, but the other one breaks his arm. And he goes down, still waving his sword in the other arm. They pull him into the woods, into the rear. And the other members of the first Union, Virginia, jump over that perpendicular wall to escape all this. So what does Fulkerson do? He takes his old regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Carson, and he judiciously puts, see what I did there? Focus yeah. it was a judge, judiciously yeah, yeah. placed Carson <laughs> right there at the perpendicular and had them forced back into the woods as well. This fight is only going to be about 15 minutes. And the, the Mr. Tubasing, the metal detecting guy that was one of the first people to have a metal detector out here in the 60s, said that he found very little spent shots in this area. Just some drop shots. The heaviest concentration of bullets are going to be up the ridge spur where we saw the other fighting coming out okay so after what i'm trying to tell you is based on that and and the accounts is after these guys are thrown back to the woods this area is uncontested essentially for the next couple hours of the battle how many of fulkerson's men are here about 500 that haven't been wiped out over in front of pritchard's help maybe a little less than that so imagine 500 officers and men tarrying here for two hours. And what Robert E. Lee does so well, for example, at the Battle of, uh, um, well, even at Antietam, is he works really well on interior lines, shifts unengaged troops to areas that are heavily engaged. Jackson has got these men that he can use now who aren't going to be heavily pressed. This flank is not going to be um, uh, threatened anymore because your would-be he Union heroes that would have come here and taken out the, the 27th and 21st aren't going to be here anymore. So it'll be up to Jackson to move those guys to the heavily pressed areas later in the day. All right? Um, was, wasn't there a, um, because of the, the hill being a, a steep ridge on this side, the, the cross communication between regiments and brigades. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna walk okay, down here. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this is this part of the wall is reinforced, remade, right? Let's go down this line here. I'm gonna show you the original, the best part of the original wall, which is what much you can look at. This is your best original wall. All right. That's probably your best view of it. Now, Ben Ritter and I have come out here in the winter. We tried to walk the whole length of this. And we were able to do it. We can't do it anymore because it's even so much more overgrown than it was in the mid-90s when he and I did it. That um, It's pretty tough to do that now. But we could actually follow the course of the wall. It's about 400 yards. So Highway 37 does not cut into the stone wall at all. We're going to go to the other side and I'll show you essentially where it ends. But it's before that yellow house. Okay. So that's your 400-yard limit. So who ends up here? Look at your map. Uh, six... Well, there's only a couple left, right? 7C is what I have in here. Ah, look at map 7C, and you see, do you see the glass farm on map 7C? Mm -hmm. Then you see the two icons for Fulkerson's brigade, right? And then you see two tiny, 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 not one tiny, not two tinies, but I, I threw three tinies in there, icons for position right here. There are two companies of the 33rd Virginia that will end up here, including the Liberty Hall Volunteers, Washington, which becomes Washington and Lee University across from, okay, they, that's where they are, they're from, and the Pulaski Guards. They're both companies out of the 33rd Virginia. When Garnet finally gets to the field with the rest of the Stonewall Brigade regiments, remember he's charged with not being with his leading regiment, which he is, it's the 33rd Virginia. So guess which regiment he comes up here with, the 33rd Virginia, back there. There's a section in the back that we can't get to anymore from here called Garnet's Field, that I called it. And he will start, when troops get, get in to meet him, he starts putting them in, in line. You see this ridge spur going up. At the top is where the 27th and 21st have been engaged. Remember, 
Colonel Patton. Da -da 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 -da. You got that? And now the 33rd is coming in. They come into the left of the 27th Virginia, so in our direction, but there's not enough room for the whole regiment. So those two companies, the Pulaski Guards and Liberty Hall Volunteers, are positioned here. So on this whole lower plain, those two companies and those 500 men, that's your Confederates down here. All right? That's Fulkerson's Brigade. These are not Fulkerson's Brigade. What brigade do they belong to? Garnet. Garnet. Garnet's Brigade, the Stonewall Brigade. So they're not going to be able to take orders from them, and they're not going to be able to take orders from Garnet unless he was given <coughs> nominal command, which that didn't happen. No communication, right? All right, so further along the ridge line, more troops are coming in. The 4th Virginia under Colonel Charles Ronald, who gets wounded, so his second in command, um, has that regiment in line, his name's, uh, I believe, Langhorn. And then further down the line comes the 2nd Virginia under James Walkinshaw Allen. I'll tell you his story when we get to the other side. The Irish Battalion, the, those guys that were, that battalion that was guarding Carpenter's Battery, they're split in two sections, two companies up there, two companies further down the line. I'll pick up their story as well. One of them uh, is Lieutenant John Heath the brother of Gettysburg, Henry Heath, who's mortally wounded here and probably dies in the glass house. All right, so Heath's brother probably dies there. All right, so this is an area that's not getting heavily pressed. This ridge spur, you can't defy gravity and stand on the ridge spur. You're gonna have a separation of troops. At the end of the day, when the Union troops will overrun that position, these guys won't know about it until it's too late. They're gonna look up here and they're gonna see all these blue uniforms swarming around here. And that's when they're essentially gonna say, feats don't fail me now, and head off toward Neal's Dam where they're gonna all get captured, the ones that do get captured there, okay? Mm -hmm. So all of Fulkerson's casualties here aren't those shot in the leg, shot in the knee, hit by shell. Most of the casualties of Fulkerson are captures retreating from the battlefield. I don't want to get too far ahead of the story, but here's the, here's the point is, who's in charge of these troops at the stone wall? Fulkerson. No, no, no one. No, nobody. Yeah, nobody. there is one person in charge. Well, Jackson is. Stonewall Jackson, not here. who leads from where a general really should be leading if we know what happens to people <laughs> during a Civil War battle. He's a half a mile in the rear, all right? Which is not where he likes to lead from, but the problem is, he is not he has not been up to this wall at all. He has no idea about the configuration of what's going on here. Had he done so, when the when the line gets heavily pressed on its right, which it will be, we'll get to that in a, at our next stop. He could shift those 500 men. I want to bring that up because I want you to put this in your mind. Garnet has no jurisdiction on Fulkerson. He can't shift those men. And the order has to come from Jackson. And during the trial, it's very interesting, um, Garnet was really mad when, obviously, when Jackson said, charge him with not being with his leading regiment when it went into battle. Because what is the answer? He was. He was with the 33rd Virginia. You know what Garnet's explanation was to the Inspector General, Sam Cooper? He said, there's no military law that says that um, a brigade commander has to be with his leading regiment, therefore you can't court-martial me for that charge. And you know what? He's right. You can't court-martial him because he wasn't with his leading regiment. But when Jackson was on the stand, it's almost like a few good men, right? The Jackson's Nicholson. Mm -hmm. Garnet's throwing the questions at him like Tom Cruise. How far were you from, or why do you think that, uh, the explain the military doctrine that says I have to be with the leading regiment when it goes into battle, and Jackson says, I think it's the, the post of honor of the commander to be with the to be with those men, to post them properly. And then Garnet asked Jackson this question. He said, Where were you when our troops first became with the enemy at the Stone Wall? And Jackson's answer said, I think about a hundred yards. The only surviving Confederate court martial transcript in history is Garnet's transcript at the White House of the Confederacy. And right next to Jackson's answer, he wrote the word lie. Oh. <laughs> he wrote the word lie about four or five times along oh, that Garnet transcript. Did. And the evidence is really clear. Jackson was not within 400 yards of this wall. Okay? So he couldn't so, stand the truth after all. Huh? So he couldn't can't stand, stand the truth. The truth. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stand the truth. Right. So that's exactly what's going on here. It's actually the story within the story. So and it's How actually... How trial end? Huh? How does that end? Uh, the Battle of Cedar Mountain will suspend it and I'll never reconvene.
<clears throat> I'll tell you that story on the other side, okay? Oh. Okay, we'll finish that up. But that's what's going on here. So Jackson's the nominal charge. He's the one in charge of moving troops on interior lines. Remember, we have to explain how, why military doctrine is, um, is, is upset here. Something happened. That's part of what happened, all right? We're gonna get to the rest of what happened on the other side. Nathan Kimball over on Pritchard's Hill has a decision to make because all that's happened here with by sending Tyler's men, smoke and noise, right? That's all that's happened from three o'clock to about 4.30. The sun sets on March 23rd, 1862, no daylight savings at 6.12, all right? So there's about an hour and a half of, of day left and maybe another 40 minutes before it gets too dark. And if you're Nathan Kimball over on Pritchard's Hill, three quarters of uh, a mile away from us, more than a mile away from us, what are your options? You're out of ammunition on, on Pritchard's Hill for your artillery, and you've sent one third of your, over a third of your entire command and created smoke and noise. What are your options? Just give me your possible three options. Retreat. What's the worst option? Retreat. Retreat which is what Jackson wanted, which is not an unreasonable option if you, if you think you're, if you're suppressed, you don't have any rounds, and, and uh, you've, you've just cost a, a, a third of your men without accomplishing anything. What's another option? Do nothing. Do nothing, all right? That's a good clinical option, yeah, yeah. by the way. Working in a hospital, we always say, don't just, uh, don't just uh, do something, stand there. Don't, in other words, don't overreact. Okay, then what's the third option? Reinforced failure. The other thing is uh, is go for broke. Yep. Larry will call it reinforced failure, which normally that would be. All right? And it should be reinforcing failure because what do you need to dislodge this? Over three to one. He doesn't have three to one to throw. All right? And yet Kimball's going to make that third decision. And we'll pick up the story. Goosebumps? Tingled down his spine? Okay, we'll pick it up. All right? Now... We could try a little shortcut that used to exist. Yeah, I don't want to go all the way around. We're just gonna we're gonna cut straight through. Okay, you're welcome to join us. Wish he'd gone like a hundred yards further west to come around the. Oh yeah, well, in uh, hindsight, sure. In hindsight, yeah. Well, but what did he know? Yeah, you know? what did he know? Off here, not important for the battle per se, but behind it, just a few yards back, are the last of the stones that we discovered of the stone wall. All of it on this side of. Route 37 that you hear over there. You look here and you look across and it looks like two hills. That's what Route 37 has done. This is one hill with a very level plateau. There's your yellow house that we saw from Pritchard's Hill. Uh, yeah. So we are still less than a mile west of that position essentially. And this is roughly where on that road bed, if it was higher, would, would be where Carpenter's battery was. Okay, with the two guns oriented to fire in that direction, probably a little further down, and probably two guns that were still firing from three quarters of a mile toward Pritchard's Hill. Um, follow me up a little ways and I'll pick you up on the next one. Get rid of the sixes. Let's go to the sevens. You see our yellow house ahead of us? So let me orient you. Where the yellow house is, almost exactly, believe it or not, is where this junction of these fence lines are. That's where the yellow house is. Okay, so we are over here where my middle finger is. Don't let me stick my middle finger out, sir. All right, but that's where we are. So the yellow house is at this junction of the fence line, and we're over here where some of this action is occurring where my middle finger is roughly, okay? This is all one hill. All right, so Carpenter's battery is going to be forced out in a few minutes when I describe the action. And the next heavily engaged Confederate artillery is not at this highway pole. The second one, you see the rise of ground behind it? That's the new acquisition um, property, right? Mm -hmm. And that is where Waters' battery is going to be. So. We're not walking any further. We don't need to. Just kind of keep this in mind. You see the yellow house. You know in relative position where we were at it on Pritchard's Hill. Kimball makes that decision. All right. It's about 4.30. And he says, you know, in his mind, I've got the three options. I'm not retreating. I'm not going to uh, just stand here. I am going to commit more troops. He doesn't have enough to 
commit completely to what Jackson's offered up here. When Jackson has all of his men in line, the Fulkerson's men, the 4th, the 2nd, the 27th, the 21st Virginia, the Irish Battalion, the artillery, he roughly will have about 1,900 to 2,100 men, not counting the casualties that they're already incurring and being incurred upon them, right? They will go all the way out to the trough and even curl in, all right? And some members of the Irish Battalion are kind of where we are right now. You would need then 6,000 total men to dislodge them. Kimball has 6,000, but that puts you right at about the three to one, and he would have to throw in every single person he had there. Well, he's not gonna do that. You can't give up your entire flank. So Sullivan's men, two regiments from Sullivan's Brigade, the two that never fire a shot, the 39th Illinois, and for the most part, the 62nd Ohio, which doesn't move to the very end of the day, they are the ones that are unengaged. The rest of the troops are going to be committed, all right? And it's going to end up in an interesting style. Again, if you're going to make it up in the aftermath, like we do about strategy with Jackson, we would say what occurred, what I'm about to describe, if you planned it to occur this way, it would be brilliant tactics. But I'm already going to tell you, it wasn't planned this way, but it does happen this way. You're going to see on echelon style assaults that are going to completely weaken this Confederate right. So the Confederate right at this moment is the second Virginia, which has overrun the trough where we were and it's curled into our position here. The first set of troops that come against them, you almost see down Route 37, coming up that hill are four companies of the 8th Ohio, 188 officers and men. They're pretty much held in place before they can get anywhere. Then three sets of regiments the really battalion size, are coming from Pritchard's Hill down to the middle road, up and over, to the Yellow House, or in other words, the junction of that fence line, and will come in this direction. Kimball has sent them, he sent them all to go after Waters Battery. But what happens is the sound of noise in a battlefield just draws, naturally by human nature, just draws infantry toward it. So the first troops coming across are the 67th Ohio. Their colonel has just been arrested and court-martialed successfully, um, Otto Bustenbinder, and his lieutenant colonel, Alvin C. Voorhees, which he, who has a wonderful set of letters and diaries at the Virginia Hysterical Society, it's been recently published. He comes through at where the Yellow House is with, with seven companies of the 67th Ohio, 350 officers and men, but he doesn't go for Waters Battery. He gets sucked into the action right over here. So opposing him is the 2nd Virginia. Now, the 2nd Virginia is having a hell of a fight because they're getting hit from Tyler's men over there, the, 80, um, the 8th Ohio there, which aren't putting too much of a fight in now. And now, boom, the 67th Ohio. James Walkinshaw Allen leads these men. Now, what I want to show you here before I, before I go on um, is that if you look at... If you look behind us, like here we are here, this wood line behind us here now is really about in the same position as the wood line on the map. That's kind of nice. It's, the fence line's following about the same con contours. I did Google Earth over this many years ago and it looked just about right. It matches very, very well. But now it's just so overgrown with everything else. Can you imagine being here in July? This is the only month you could actually do this tour out here, right? The breath, it just gets too overgrown. All right, so when the 67th comes out, the second Virginia has to repel them. James Waukesha Allen's leadership has been put under question because at the first battle of Manassas, his regiment was put into confusion. And it's unfortunate because Allen only had one eye. His, he had an eye, an accident as a child, some percussion cap thing that took out the sight of one eye. And what's Murphy's Law going to tell you? That you're going to lose your good eye at the worst moment. And in that second battle, the first battle of Manassas, when Union artillery hit, a, hit the pines above the second Virginia, limbs came crashing down and guess what? Hit Allen in the face, temporarily blinded him, and his regiment was said to have acted in cowardice that day. So Allen has to prove himself in the next battle. Believe it or not, that next battle is nine months later. It's here. All right, and he does a great job. He's losing four flag bearers. Up, down, up, down, up, down, three flag bearers. He's the fourth one. He jumps off his horse, 
gets the flag, plants it in the ground, not too far from where we are, and his men rally around it, and they, that restores their faith in his leadership. Unfortunately, like Fulkerson, he's also killed June 27th, the Battle of Gaines's Mill, but he, for that moment, he had his glory right here on the defensive at, at uh, the first Battle of Kernstown. But now more pressure, okay, on echelon, on echelon. The next regiment coming through is the 5th Ohio. They started with 10 companies leaving Pritchard's Hill, but the bugler went to call them all back and only half the companies heard them. So five companies, another battalion, they come out almost in front of us between these two highway poles. And the only thing facing off against them is the Irish battalion. And Lieutenant Colonel John Patrick is unable to push those five companies past them. And now what's happening is behind that second highway pole is where the middle, where the Apple Valley Road runs up and over the, the topographical crest of Sandy Ridge. Mm -hmm. Along that part of the road is a stone wall. On his own, Lieutenant Colonel from the 21st Virginia, John M. Patton, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> takes his men, at least several hundred of them, and pulls them back 550 yards and puts them behind that second stone wall when he sees how heavily pressed that area is. Okay, so he abandons this part, puts him over there. Now, the next regiment coming out is the 84th Pennsylvania. Do they show on our map here? Yep. Okay, again, a battalion size unit. They only have 255 officers and men. And like the Colonel of the, the second uh, Virginia, their Colonel is under question for his leadership. His name is William Gray Murray. Very distinguished, gray eyed, six foot, one inch officer who had a petition handed to him two days before this battle, signed by 17 line officers, requesting that he resign because he had, quote, you lack the peculiar instinct which qualifies you for martial command, was the exact wording. One of the things they complained about was that he wasn't drilling them enough. Can you believe that, okay? But anyway, he refuses to step down and now, he is in a really awful spot. He is coming up to the left of the 5th Ohio, in line next to that second highway pole, across that level plane of what is now Route 37 cutting across the hill, going toward where those trees are at the topographical crest, and what's in front of them? Waters Battery and the 21st Virginia behind that stone wall. If you read the most famous account from the 21st, John Worsham, he talks about how the members of Company F will, will, will sit on the fence and annihilate a regiment. You can't be sitting on a Virginia worm fence. What fence, what kind of a fence were they sitting on? Nobody ever, it's, it's got to be the stone fence. It's exactly what they're on, okay? So the 84th is coming across, and it, for Murray, if you remember that scene in Glory, this is as close as it's going to get, okay, to Fort Wagner. Here is Murray, he's getting, trying to scale the hill. A third of his command is melting away. 92 men killed and wounded out of those out of those 255 and 20 minutes. Murray's horse is hit from under him and hobbles to the rear. The flag bearer is behind Murray, and Murray turns to his adjutant and says, we must either charge or we must retreat. By God, we won't retreat. And he turns around to give the order to charge, faces against that water's battery. In front of him is a member of the Irish battalion who hits Murray with a shot goes, takes the eight and four from his cap and plants it through his brain. Mm. And Murray's skull explodes through the back in the flag and he falls back killed, just, just terrorizing the rest of his regiment. And it knocks them out of commission. I'm bringing all this up because it's some of the most interesting things that happened here, all right? The 84th did one thing right in all this. They, they, they were very brave, but they went for the guns like they were supposed to. And what they will do is lead the next regiment in toward them, the full strength, 400 officers and men of the 14th Indiana. All right, before I get to their story, let me finish up here saying, right, I said this battle got a lot of attention right after it was over. Reporters from all over the place were coming here, including New York City reporters. A reporter from the New York World came here just a few days afterwards by train. And Captain Robert Harrell of the 84th Pennsylvania took that reporter to where that highway pole is and said, we need to have a monument put here with inscription and letters of gold to commemorate our dear Colonel William Murray. The first attempt to make this a park, right? 
What Captain Harrell conveniently failed to tell that reporter was that his was the first name on that petition asking Murray to resign two days early. <laughs> first name on that petition. All right. So by proving himself in battle, at least he settled the issue of leadership with his men once and for all. I, when I, I got hired by Time Life Books, their Voices of the Civil War series, and they sent me to, I did a lot of the writing of that particular volume on Shenandoah 62, and I had some good 84th stuff. And it was at the time my book was already in, and they wanted me to find an image of Murray for the book. And I went to the Baker Mansion in Altoona, Pennsylvania, all right? Uh, Murray's buried right nearby in Hollidaysburg in a fairly unkempt uh, cemetery. Nice gravestone, though. And I go in, and I see a beautiful painting, and I know it's him. And I said, that's William Murray. And they said, uh, some Pennsylvania guy, right? I said, some Pennsylvania guy. He's the first Pennsylvania colonel killed in the Civil War in a battle. He goes, really? He says, what battle is that? I said, Kernstown. Son, what was the name of that battle? Because I was only 20 nine years old, they could call me son, right? <laughs> he said, what, what battle was that? I said, Kernstown. He said, well, you, I got something to show you. Come over here. And he pulls out of this drawer a skull of a horse, the horse that was shot under Murray. This horse was killed um, uh, under underneath Colonel Murray at the Battle of Kernstown, the horse that hobbled to the rear. And of course, you're supposed to think this is the coolest thing in the world. But all I could think of is Godfather. This is the God, the horse's head. How does it come back to Pennsylvania with Murray's body? <laughs> right? So the story is, I looked this up. They had a big commemoration thing at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the capital, with the horse and the colonel as the first martyrs in a, on a battlefield. It was really a really cool event. And there's the horse's head. Now, about 10 years after that, my friend who worked for a flags commission got me in to the Pennsylvania flags and we pulled out the 84th and you could see the gore spot where Murray fell into the back of that flag and all the 42 holes that were put into the flag shot through the, this battle. I mean, that was a truly, truly battlefield relic. It was, it was astonishing to see that. So the 84th does its job, although they don't complete it because now the 14th Indiana is gonna come in. And here we are, look at the situation. It is almost six o'clock, March 23rd. What time does the sun set? Ah, you guys are great. All right. Look at that. Go to map 8A. If Garnet had map 8A, there'd be no trial. All right. <laughs> Look what's about to happen to Garnet's position. He's about to have his right and his rear collapsed by the 14th Indiana, which is going to cave in the 21st Virginia, is going to capture two guns, one from Waters Battery and one from the Rockbridge Artillery. Where's Garnet? Garnet is over here probably completely unaware about about what's about to happen to him all right but serendipitously if i could use that as an adverb he calls for a retreat but maybe not for the all the reasons that you would think good reason to call for retreat is if that's about to happen to you he doesn't know about that he calls for a retreat for three reasons one um he one is that the most suspicious one he says he sees a resurgence in the union line in front of him what I really think is he sees Union Cavalry working around the flank, and they do have a pretty good day at the end, but not, not Tyler's men in general. They can't do any more. Um, he sees too many of his own men falling around him, so he has a lot of casualties at the stone wall. And then the third one is that they run out of ammunition. They carried 40 to 60 rounds. And if you're firing, you know, in, if, if you're not experienced in a battle, you're only gonna get maybe two rounds off in a minute, and you probably fired your ramrod because you forgot, right? So, uh, but even if you did that, two rounds a minute and you only have 40 to 60 rounds, guess what? You're not gonna be in a protracted fight that's gonna go on for two hours. Everybody is, Jackson will write in his report about how they borrowed liberally from fallen comrades. Doesn't matter, when all those rounds are used, the Garnet's trying to get them in line. They said, we have nothing else to fire. What are we supposed to do? He sees his men starting to abandon the line. And for all those reasons, at 6 o'clock, right about 6 o'clock, he calls for the retreat, which makes Jackson angry because Jackson thinks he's starting to get reinforcements to help him. Uh, and it's one of his angry charges. He can't be court-martialed for that. And Jackson doesn't really press this one because it's not hold this line at all costs. If that was the order, you can't retreat for any reason. This was Garnet um, 
should have encouraged his command to hold its position was the exact charge, which means that there is some discretion in the wording, mm -hmm. right? So Garnet only has to give a reasonable excuses for it. Map A would have been a great excuse, but he wouldn't have had Map A with him, right? So he calls the retreat and it happens at the right time. Now it's a melee for the last potential hour of light after sunset and, and last night of the light of the, the post sunset um, twilight. All the troops coming in from the, from the Union East and from the North are caving in that line completely. And what did Kimball do, but not by planning, by happenstance, on echelon? Boom, 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 right? 8th, 67th, 5th, 84th, big punch from the 14th, and the 13th coming right in behind them. Again, I'm not saying it was planned that way at all, but that's how you, that is the answer to your military doctrine. Got it? Mm -hmm. You completely bent and weakened the line, and Jackson's two biggest failings, no small arms ammunition was brought to this field from Newtown. And secondly, all those unengaged, those 500 men of Fulkerson's brigade, they would have been wonderful here. They would have done beautifully to fill in the line over here. They're unused for the rest of the day. So for the last hour of the fight, Jackson's men are chased from the ridge. Jackson loses two cannons. He loses 719 officers and men, the equivalent of a regiment, 251 healthy Confederates are captured. And, and for those of us that study battles, you say, well, those are kind of pseudo casualties because they're not killed or wounded. I'm saying this is, except for killed, this is worse. Because a lot of your wounded end up back in the ranks for the next battle or the next part of the campaign. These men all going to Fort Delaware are out of the Valley campaign for the rest of it. The equivalent size of a regiment. And it was more detrimental to Jackson having those captured than if they were all wounded, even if some of those wounded had died, because he will never see them again. So, go ahead. Uh, they weren't paroled at that stage of the war, weren't they? No, they were exchanged on August 5th, after it was all over. Okay. After it was all over. They come back, a lot of them come back, but not until after the Valley Campaign, mm -hmm. right? So, so when that's all done, when this, the Union will own this field, Jackson will be sent in retreat. I think as a group, since we have just a few cars, I want to take us to Stony Lonesome, the retreat route down that double. Yeah, yeah lead. We got we to gotta pick that one up. That'll okay. be cool. Uh, but we're, what I want to finish with here is that same uh, officer, Samuel List, that wrote to his parents, said Winchester's too pretty a place. I believe we've taken it from them. He's up here. And he goes down the line and just sees the horror of this battlefield. And he writes to his parents about nothing that he saw that was pretty that night. He says, oh, it was a horrible sight to see the dead, the wounded lying about the principal part of them shot in the head. One of the Confederates, he called them rebels, uh, begged me as I passed by him to shoot him. But enough of this. <clears throat> Just couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Couldn't take it. All right. And so these guys couldn't light fires that night. They had to kind of stay here, the victors of the field. Uh, 575 killed and wounded. Their Jackson's only loss as an independent commander was right here at Kernstown. He made some big time mistakes that cost him this battlefield. Lost the momentum on the offensive, lack of communication with his officers, lack of supply, inability to shift troops um, uh, from engaged and unengaged areas. Just a generally a very poor job. And the worst thing about Jackson, unlike Robert E. Lee in this battle, what did Lee say as the troops came streaming off of Gettysburg? It's all my fault. What did Jackson say? He pointed to Garden and said, boys, it's all his fault, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't, couldn't take that responsibility himself. He had to blame other people for it. Mm -hmm. um, and the story was, and we'll finish this up before you go back to the cars, um, is that, as I said, this becomes an overreaction on the Union side because of General Shields, that great politician, as I said. He claimed that he called all the shots from his sickbed and that everybody else was just following his instructions. So Nathan Kimball, the true victor on this field, never got credit for it for at least 130 years. Mm. And Shields bragging eventually sparked this campaign because he claimed that he he defeated a reinforced opponent that numbered 11,000 men when Jackson had no more than 3,700 here. So the War Department overreacted to that. They initially sent 20,000 troops to the valley. That included Blanker's division going to Fremont, for example. A lot of those troops, except for Blanker's men, will go back to McClellan again. Um, and will, Alpheus Williams, of course, will return as well. Uh, but that overreaction is what Jefferson Davis will will monitor 
and two months later he'll set Jackson loose to get the same reaction out of Lincoln, which he effectively does. That is by planning. This was by happenstance. Got that? So, in the end, Garnet, as we talked about, gets arrested on April 1st. Al, um, Albert, uh, 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 not Albert, uh, Charles Sidney Winder takes over for him. And uh, Garnet sets up his defense, starts the court martial like he's the Tom Cruise against the Jack Nicholson Jackson. And after two days, the trial is suspended because of the Cedar Mountain campaign. It's a little overstated, overwrought in the fact that Garnet was already put back in command before the trial started by special orders number uh, 25 in D.H. Hill's division. Uh, in fact, within weeks of the trial, he is leading a brigade of troops at um, Sharpsburg. His troops are positioned where the National Cemetery is today. So his reputation wasn't all that damaged. This whole story about he rode his horse as a death wish at Gettysburg is a little far-fetched because Jackson was pretty litigious against everybody, wasn't he? So uh, when Gar Garnet rode that horse, it was because he got kicked in the leg in Snickers Gap. But before that even happened, um, Garnet, by his own um, wishes, was a pallbearer at Jackson's funeral, all right? And so when he gets uh, killed at Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, of those 17 officers, Confederate uh, generals, um, taken down in the battle. Garnet's was a body that wasn't found. Uh, and it's believed that he was reinterred at Hollywood Cemetery, but nobody could tell you for sure. His sword ends up in a, in a Baltimore pawn shop. And if you go to the Museum of the Confederacy, it's just kind of uh, probably metaphorically perfect that his sword is on display and exactly one floor above it is the sword of Stonewall Jackson, <laughs> whose reputation uh, he had essentially kept down that whole time. Uh, so we'll, uh, that's kind of the story with Kernstown. This battle sparked, uh, as the first Battle of the Valley campaign, sparked everything that will happen after it, right? And a lot of what-ifs could have happened out here. But as you saw from visiting a lot of this 600 acres, at least without getting into the tangles, what we could see for this field. Any questions about it? What I want us to do with our small group, we're going to go back to our cars, we'll go back down Jones's Road to Long Chris mm -hmm. so they could see the third stone wall because the last defensive action, really good performance by Confederates from the 5th and the 42nd Virginia, about 700 men, who on the very last ditch effort will be put in reserve by Garnet behind the stone wall. We're going to go around this cul-de-sac at the end of Long Chris and then you're going to look up to your right and you'll see exactly where the, the 5th and the and the 42nd Virginia held off seven times their numbers for over 20 minutes, taking 130 casualties and allowed Jackson to escape. And that were the, the 48th, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Hamden artillery roared up at the last minute. Also, yeah, and I don't, I don't have a lot of accounts of them, but yeah, they, they were on their way up so, as well. Yeah, I have a thing in our, it's a quote, they tells us, don't tell me the Fort the Hamden wasn't engaged. We were, and this is what we did. Yeah. But yeah. they were, they came in right as everybody was running past right. them. Right. And even members, of the, the regiment that didn't get engaged, the 48th Virginia in Newtown, enough men stole away from that regiment to get involved in the battle. Mm -hmm. Some of them got captured and ended up at Fort Delaware for a regiment that was supposedly totally unengaged as well. So we're going to go from there because we don't have a we have a nice number of small vehicles. We're going to do something that a tour group doesn't ever do. In fact, you're the second group that's going to do this. We're going to go to Jackson's retreat route and I'm going to show you a really special route of retreat that's locked in time. Okay? Oh, wow. cool. Along with a colonial structure that he went by at the time. Beautiful. All right? All right, so yeah. follow me out. Okay, to come out at Opecken Church and now they're retreating due east. What, what can you see from on top of that hill? Uh, I don't know. I've never been up there. But anyway, that, that's the route that Ramser will take to get to the second Kernstown battlefield. And Hotchkiss will lead him right down this road. This is a very historic route that's locked in time now because when the model, they said that starting the years the Model T's used to run through here is when they, they cut off this road and went to other routes. But <laughs> This was actually when vehicles were started to get motorized is when they stopped using this as a real road. Isn't that amazing? Locked in time. And the original bill. So this is Jackson in 28. He leads the Kernstown battlefield with a big brigade essentially. 2,800 men. Infantry, cavalry, artillery. It's always got it. They've redone it's this always... entire wall. Well, I would say this is a mess. Probably looked like that. Yeah. You see the old wall? I mean, this is all reinforced. Yeah. That's the old one back. That's the original. Yeah. And that is 
Zach's escaping. Isn't that amazing? I can't believe what they've done. I, I rode my bike down here.